Okay, so let's officially start. Hello, everyone. My name is Pavel. I will be the host and the moderator of this Quantum Machine Learning Conference 2023. Uh, so first of all, thank you for uh, for attending. Thank you, thank you for signing up. Uh, and uh, as you know from the agenda, today we'll have six speakers. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Mandar Pande, and he will give a talk about an you know, overview of mathematical foundations for quantum computing and quantum machine learning. Uh, so Dr. Mandar, uh, first of all, thank you very much for accepting our invitation and to, to give this talk. Uh, maybe before we start, just uh, an announcement to, to our participants. If you have any questions during the talk, please post your questions on our chat. And after the talk, there will be a Q&A session. We'll try to ask your questions or at least uh, the most important, the most interesting, because our time is limited. Uh, but uh, yeah, so let's let's organize it uh, uh, using the chat. Okay, so I think we can start. So Dr. Mandar, if you are ready, the Zoom is yours and we are looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you, Pavel. Uh, so I would like to thank the QAIF Foundation. Um, thank you, Pavel, as well as Anshul there. I think I was introduced by Anshul. Uh, so given the time constraints, let me quickly start uh, the talk. Uh, so so this is what uh, I would try to cover. I think it's a bit too much. And uh, I'm sure I'll not be able to cover the whole thing. But at least the good part will be if you, if you wish to, you can take a screenshot of this particular slide so that you at least know what are the basics from a mathematical standpoint that you need to really get acquainted with when you would like to become an aspiring quantum computing scientist. So I will start my talk by talking about some, you know, very useful learning resources, uh, which I have gone through myself. Uh, and uh, then I will sort of give a context as to why uh, and what kind of mathematics is required by actually talking about the postulates of quantum mechanics. Uh, a specific uh, system called as two-level quantum systems, I will uh, give you a way of context. So this will sort of set a context about uh, why is it uh, the kind of maths we talk about is required to understand quantum computing. And then, you know, uh, given that my target audience is uh, aspiring quantum computing scientists, very briefly, just one slide about complex numbers, and then the linear algebra part, uh, and then the rest of the stuff. So I'll, I'll not go through all of these things uh, at this point in time. Let me see how much I can cover. I'm sure I'll not be able to cover uh, more than half of whatever is the topic here. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> so half an, actually I take about 10 sessions to cover this whole uh, mathematics. So Pavel, so you can understand that <laughs> half an hour is just, uh, I'll just scratch the surface. Okay, so, uh, so in terms of learning resources, the best is uh, this book by Nielsen and Chuang. It's sometimes they call it Mike and Ike. So this is one of the best books, but uh, for that, I, th I think to get to that, there will be some level of understanding of basic quantum computing required from other sources, which I'm sure a lot of people do have. This is downloadable. I mean, there's a link over there. You can just download this, uh, this book free if you wish to, but I would suggest you purchase a copy so that you really value the you know the book. Uh, other uh, resources, one of them is called as quantum.country.qcvc. Um, uh, you know, one of the authors there is Michael Linsen. It's a very interesting uh, way of understanding quantum computing. There, there are three sessions in that, uh, three separate articles. Uh, you, I, I, would, I leave it to you to sort of look at it. Then uh, while I'm not advocating um, a particular uh, system like uh, IBM or whatever, but this is, I found this to be very useful. So I am suggesting this to you. Then uh, I've also attended uh, some of these schools um, by IBM. So you could also maybe go through at least this part, you certainly need to, you certainly need to do that even this one. Um, and then depending on your interest, you can look at other things. I have undergone all of these courses, uh, you know, by the big shots of quantum computing, Dr. Peter Shore is there, Isaac Chuang is there, and then you have Adam Harrow, big, big people. HHL is an algorithm called as HHL, uh, you know, so it's one of the authors is Adam Harrow. Um, and then Lloyd is there. So HDM Harrow Lloyd, that's the algorithm on linear uh, equations. So that uh, the quantum aspects of that. So you can, you know, it will be very good for you to go through this. The very rigorous ones, but very good, uh, you know, they're available as audit courses nowadays on EDX. Okay, uh, so just one slide about my research, uh, recent work. Uh, I'll not talk much about it, but that's what I've done recently. 
No, let's get down to the postulates of quantum mechanics, which sort of sets the context for quantum computing. So the first postulate is called as state of system. And uh, the objective of putting these things is that through this, I will also tell you what math is required uh, to follow up. So first is something called a state of a system. Uh, we'll also need to understand what do you mean by a system, which I will talk about when you talk about two level systems. Second is something called uh, observable quantities, which are represented by operators. All of these are uh, you know, terminologies in quantum mechanics. Third, a very important uh, postulate about something called measurements. Uh, the way we measure in quantum mechanics is very different from conventional classical measurements that we do for macroscopic objects. And the fourth is something called time evolution of a particular system. So while many of you may not understand these things, uh, it'll at least give you a context that you've heard about these things and you now you can pursue this further. So these are the postulates of quantum mechanics. Uh, you know, so we have something called a state of a quantum system, uh, which you can represent by something called a vector uh, as, as in a vector space. And uh, this is uh, also a vector in something called a Hilbert space. I will be defining a Hilbert space in the next few slides. Then uh, the second thing point is that when we talk about the state of a quantum system, all the information um, is available in that particular state. And when we, when we, uh, when we work with uh, quantum systems, we work with something called normalized vectors, which we call as state vectors. And uh, this, this is something called inner product, which is equal to one that is it's normalized. Uh, this is uh, something called uh, Dirac notation, which again, I'll sort of briefly touch upon uh, eventually. Uh, so uh, the qubit is a state vector in a complex two-dimensional vector space. That is, that's the meaning, that's a fundamental building block of a quantum computer. And the way we represent this is through something called basis states. These, these two are called as basis states, state zero, and the state one. And these can be represented as two dimensional vectors. And uh, alpha and beta are called as um, amplitude, they call, they call as probability amplitudes. And uh, the they are normalized as that alpha square plus beta square mod of that is equal to one. So that is uh, something called a state of a system. I'm sorry. But the second thing is called as observable quantity. So, you know, in classical mechanics, when we talk about uh, observation or when you talk about some specific quantities that we would like to measure, like for example, distance is one. Uh, then you have angular momentum, for example, or you have, uh, you know, you have acceleration. All of these things are, uh, you know, we call them as basic functions or uh, some, uh, in, in quantum mechanics, we call them as operators. Energy also is an operator. And, um, you know, each of these operators are something called Hermitian. Uh, when you talk about something called uh, mathematical, uh, the matrix formulation of quantum mechanics, then we have something called Hermitian uh, matrices as well as the unitary matrices, which we will talk about. And um, uh, and and the second point is that the eigenvectors, they form a complete orthonormal basis of this vector space. So again, these are uh, you know various terms which are mathematically oriented and I'll talk about them in the later slide. Third thing is called as measurements. Now the possible measurements, results of the measurement of a dynamical variable A are called as all the eigenvalues. So we will be dealing with something called eigenvalue equations uh, in, in quantum mechanics and quantum computing. And the fourth postulate is something called the time evolution of a system. And the way it is given, so when you talk about a time independent you know, quantum system, then you talk in terms of something called H psi equal to E psi. Okay, so this essentially is uh, something called an eigenvalue equation where H is called as the Hamiltonian. It's also the total energy of the system. And this is, uh, as I told you, it's an operator. And this is the eigenvalues or the energy states of that particular operator over here. So if you, if you look at any normal, uh, you know, eigenvalue equation, for example, AX is equal to lambda X. So this particular equation essentially maps to that. You, you know, this is essentially a vector. So, and this again is a vector. So that mapping happens normally, uh, naturally. Uh, so the time evolution, so this is a time independent um, uh, something called a Schrodinger equation, and this is the time dependent you know, uh, Schrodinger equation, where um, H again is the Hamiltonian, and this is the rate of uh, the rate of change of this variable, sorry, of this uh, vector psi as a function of time. Um, and so essentially, these are the four postulates, and around that you can see a lot of mathematics that is, and I already spoke about. I spoke about unitary matrices. I spoke about Hermitian matrices. I spoke about something called the state of a system. 
I spoke about uh, you know eigenvalue equations. I spoke about uh, you know multiple things. So we will look at that aspect in a few minutes. Now, from a quantum computing standpoint, what are the quantum mechanical principles which are important? So the first one is called a superposition. So when we wrote that a, a, a qubit can be represented as psi equal to alpha zero plus uh, beta one. Uh, essentially, this addition, addition sign essentially uh, means that you are talking about superposition of states. The second thing is called as entanglement. And uh, these are essentially what it means is that uh, if you have two qubits, then uh, they cannot be uh, represented separately or they cannot be separated out. And uh, they have to be treated as a single entity yeah, in a very simplistic kind of a fashion. And the third one is interference. Uh, you know, many of you may have heard about something called the Young's double slit experiment. Uh, if you haven't, then I would strongly recommend you to look it up on on LinkedIn. Uh, sorry, on on the inter on the internet. So Young's double slit experiment, um, which essentially was a uh, an experiment which says said that light behaves like a wave, uh, but it also behaves like a like a like a particle. So you know when you have a slit. And uh, you know you send light through um, these two slits, then you get something called an, called an interference pattern, uh, which essentially looks something like this. And uh, that is because of something called interference. So that is the these are the three principles which are very important, uh, you know, uh, to remember. And uh, you know we will be giving some mathematical interpretations to each of these. So now let's come down to something called two-level systems. So for those people who really understand quantum mechanics very well, uh, they know that if you look at a hydrogen atom, for example, you have a nucleus and then um, you know the electron sort of is revolving around this. And this electron, if it's in the ground state, it is at this particular level zero, I'll call it level zero. Uh, as it gets excited, it goes down to you know higher levels and uh, so on and so forth. Um, and uh, to be able to go to higher levels, it has to you know essentially gain some energy. And when it comes down, uh, it sends a photon or, or some kind of energy, which which is released, which is the difference between these two levels. Now, uh, in quantum mechanics, you can talk in terms of infinite le number of levels, and then you get to something called a continuum. Uh, when we talk about quantum computing systems, we, we do an approximation saying that a quantum system uh, may be only of two levels. So we can consider either this as level zero, and this is level one, or you can consider any two you know, levels which are uh, close to each other as level zero and level one. So when I talk about a quantum system in uh, quantum mechanics, hydrogen is one example. So this is actually a quantum system, which has got infinite levels in this case. Whereas when you want to approximate just to, um, to two levels, then you talk about something called a two level quantum system. And that two level quantum system can, as I told you earlier, can be represented in terms of this zero level, and this one level or zero state and one state. And this is the zero state. Maybe this can be this particular ground state over here. And this one is uh, the excited state, which can probably be this one. So uh, the the mathematical representation of these quantum system or two-level system is given by this qubit. So qubit essentially um, is a two-level system from a quantum mechanical standpoint. How do you physically realize is what we talk about in terms of superconducting qubits, we talk in terms of photonic qubits, we talk in terms of you know ion traps, whatever it is. So the, how you realize this is a separate uh, question, but how do you represent it mathematically is this. This is the way you represent it. Now, when you talk about uh, number of qubits, so let's say this is qubit number, qubit one, this is qubit two, and this is qubit three. So each of them is a two-level system, and uh, you know you can represent a general quantum state as a superposition of these three states, or a, a combination of these three states. Okay, so the combination is represented by something called a tensor product, which is given by this particular sign. So when I combine uh, a set of two level systems, which are essentially qubits, then the way I represent it is zero, tensor product one, tensor product zero here, because this is at state zero, this state at a higher state, and this again at a lower state. So that's why I call it as zero, one, zero. And in short, I can represent that in terms of this zero one zero. Sorry, I have not explained to you what do you mean by this notation, but I will do it in a few minutes. Just bear with me. So, in general, when you have n such qubits, then or let's say three a three qubit system, for example, in this case, each of this 
qubits can either exist in state zero or state one. And that way, because you've got three qubits, so you will have two to the power of three number of possible states in which the system can exist. And that's what is given over here. So all zeros, that means all ground states, all ones, that means all in the excited state and all in between. And this is exactly like uh, the probability amplitude over here. And the mod square sum of each of these C01 square, the C11 square up to C17 square should equal to one. That's the total probability that it's available. So that's how you represent a general, uh, general uh, quantum state. Now, for the going down, uh, when you would like to, you know, you know, do some computation using a quantum system, then you take some set of initial states over here, apply some kind of a quantum circuit, which is essentially some kind of a function, and then you get an outcome over here. Okay, so this outcome, this part is represented by this quantum circuit. In this case, we are talking of gate-based computing. So that's why you have some specific gates. These are your initial states, which is given over here. Uh, these are your final states, uh, which is given over here. And uh, the way uh, the transformation actually happens from this to this is through the quantum circuit, which is a combination of different kinds of gates. You have something called a single qubit gates and you have multiple qubit gates. So C0 is something called a control knot, and these are something called a rotation gate, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, and these, this C0 essentially, well, let me not talk about it right away. So uh, that's what it is. Uh, somebody's on uh, unmuted, can you please mute? Yeah, thank you. So now with this uh, basic that we have done, um, I think I just have about 10 more minutes. So I'll quickly rush through some of the aspects. As I told you, I'll not be able to cover the whole thing, but let us rush through some things. Um, it is worth noting that the mass required for quantum compute, for quantum mechanics, is much easier in comparison to the mass required for classical mechanics. Okay, so I think uh, I think we should thank uh, the likes of Eisen Heisenberg and Planck and Dirac, all those people, for making things reasonably easy for us to understand. Okay, so let's get to the linear algebra required. So one of the biggest uh, requirements that you have is linear algebra, and in but the only thing is that you will be dealing with linear algebra in for complex vectors. Okay, and so that's the reason why I talk about complex numbers. Um, for those who know complex numbers, uh, I think uh, nothing very difficult. You talk about Z as a complex number, which is a sum of a real number and a, a sum of two numbers. These are real numbers, but you have this I where I squared is equal to minus one, and A is the real part of this uh, complex number, and B is the imaginary part. And then Z star is a complex conjugate of Z. A lot of other things there, but uh, you know, this is just, just a very, very high level overview. Uh, the second concept that, um, you know, very, very important is often called vectors, vector spaces, and the Hilbert space. Okay, so vector in, um, in a quantum computing, um, in general, if you talk about a vector V, you can talk in terms of V1, V2, Vn, where each of these are normal numbers, real numbers. Like let's say I can talk about V being equal to one, two, minus one, uh, 10. This could be a, a vector. Um, when you talk about a quantum computing and because you're going to talk about two level systems, so a vector will essentially contain only two elements, so V1 and V2. So I, I can represent this either, either as a column vector or I can represent it as a row vector, V1 and V2. Okay. Um, so that is uh, the first part that we talk about a vector as a tuple. And the second is you can add two vectors. So if U and V are two vectors, uh, then U plus V equal to W. And the way you do it is that uh, if U equal to, equal to U1 and U2, V equal to V1 and V2, then uh, when you add U plus V, that's U1 plus V1 is one, and U2 plus V2 is the second one. And that is the essential addition of two vectors. And they that new vector W also belongs to something called a vector space. Uh, I'll tell you about a vector space in just a minute. The third thing is something called multiplication of a scalar with a vector. So if, if alpha is a, is a scalar, that is any number, any real number, and when you multiply that with a uh, vector V, then that gives, let's say, another, another vector u, which again belongs to the vector space v. Okay, so when you have these three properties, that is that representing vector as a tuple, addition of two vectors, 
and multiplication of vector with a scalar then you say that that those set of elements they belong to a vector space v now the the fourth point is that when you talk about something called the existence of a scalar product of two vectors okay so when i say uh, you know u dot v and when i say this is called as a scalar product and this gives you a number k so when you talk about an existence of a scalar product these three properties constitute something called a hilbert space okay so a hilbert space is a special case of a vector space with this addition of the existence of a scalar product of two vectors okay so that is a, a next point then the other things that we will need to understand is something called the inner product and outer product so when you have a and b the inner product is essentially your scalar product that we spoke about and uh, this actually should be a1 star and uh, a2 star over here and this is uh, diagonal matrix uh, sorry uh, it's a um, uh, it's a transpose of the matrix and so you will get a1 star and uh, b1 a2 star b2 which is a scalar the outer product essentially you multiply each of able elements a1 and a2 with each of these elements over here so a1 times b1 is the first element a1 times b2 is the second element a2 times b1 is third and a2 times b2 is the fourth so this is called as the outer product there are some basic principles that all of us will need to know uh, which will be which will eventually use in, in actual computations third concept is of the eigen value equation and um, you know for a real vector space Uh, the diagonal equations ax equal to lambda x you can instead of r i can call this as a complex vector space where a can have elements which are complex so sorry x can be complex and so can a so in the real vector space c is the eigen value uh, equation um sorry in the complex vector space c the eigen value equation for a vector is represented by this one which i told you earlier and uh, the solution everybody knows how to do this but i just put in this slide i just slide this slide over here for those who may want to understand it but i'll not get into details it's, it's very simple to you know get the eigen values and eigen vectors but there is some element of a bit of a complication in the eigen vector uh, the other concept is something called orthogonalization and orthonormalization uh, pavel how much time do i have uh, one or two minutes more uh about 3 minutes if possible but if you need a few more yeah. just let us know mm -hmm. <laughs> okay i'll try to co complete whatever i can in that time uh the other concept is called as orthogonalization orthonormalization so when the inner product of two vectors is zero so inner product i just now showed you uh, here this is the inner product so when a1 dot uh, sorry a dot b is equal to zero then you say that these two vectors are orthogonal okay and when uh, when you take a dot a and is that if that is equal to 1 then you say that this particular vector is normalized okay so that's essentially what i'm talking about here and you know you can look at orthogonal vectors and orthonormal vectors as a general case of let's say if you take a cartesian set of coordinates so when i have you know let's say i have x i have y and this is a three dimensional orthogonal system because the angle between x and y between y and z and between x and z are all 90 degrees so in principle when i talk about orthogonal vectors like i can say x is a vector in this direction y is a vector in this direction and the product between these two is zero and that's the reason why they call it orthogonal systems similarly when i take uh, uh, the unit vector over here which is called which can be represented as, as x hat or sometimes they also call it as i j and k if uh, people remember their basic cartesian coordinates so you you know that i dot j equal to 0 j dot k equal to 0 uh, k dot i equal to 0 and i dot i equal to 1 and equal to j dot day j equal to k dot k all of them is equal to 1 so these are called as orthonormal vectors so uh, you know so the orthogonal vectors and orthonormal vectors are a, are a general case of you know the cartesian coordinates and so on and so forth so and these these essentially form uh this this form the basis of around which you can create a lot of you know generalized vectors so that's the reason for the orthogonalization and orthonormalization properties 
Yeah, I just spoke about basis states. So I can say that if I have three vectors which are orthogonal to each other or two vectors, so let's say I is a unit vector and J is another unit vector. And I can say that I and J, they form a set of bases or basis functions so that I can represent any general vector in terms of this I and J. So if I have this X direction with a unit vector I and a unit vector J over here, which is in the Y direction, then any general uh, you know, vector over here can be represented in terms of I and J. Okay, so what I can say is that if this is two, this is three, and this is one and this is two, I can say that, um, you know, three minus two X or I plus um, two minus one J. This is my general vector B. I can put it that way. So this is X or plus, sorry, not X. I plus J. This is, a, this is a vector which I can essentially represent in terms of these two orthogonal vectors or orthonormal vectors in this case. So that's that's a that's a foundation for the basis state. Okay, and then finally, uh, I'll, I'll, I think I'll stop at this point by just explaining the submission and unitary matrices. So sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, these are poly matrices, and uh, they are extremely important in quantum computing. Um, sigma x is actually a matrix. Uh, represent like this, 0, 1, 1, 0. Sigma y is equal to 0, minus i, i, and 0. And uh, sigma z is equal to 1, 0, and 0, and minus 1. And if you add the unit uh, matrix or the identity matrix, 1, 0, 0, 1, then 1, this uh, matrix, along with sigma i, uh, sorry, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z, these form something called an orthonormal basis around which the whole of quantum computing can be explained. Okay, so uh, I think, uh, Pavel, I'm going to stop at this point. Uh, Tense mm -hmm. product is, uh, I think, um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll probably share this slide deck if you wish to, but uh, I think I'm, I'm sort of uh, done at this point, given the paucity of time. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mandar. Uh, so maybe just announcement to everyone. As you know, this uh, uh, this talk is recorded, so hopefully uh, the video will be later available on our YouTube channel as well, so you can also watch it. Uh, are there any questions to Dr. Mandar? We have two minutes to the next talk, so I believe it's time maybe for just one question. But I don't see any questions now on the chat, so let's maybe wait a while, maybe someone would like to unmute and ask. I think I should say I'm, I should I should sort of kind of apologize a bit because it was a bit too much for some people who may not have, uh, you know, some yeah, and grounding. don't don't worry. It I think it was it was very good because uh, this conference was intended to people who already has at least a basic understanding of okay. quantum mechanics, and I I'm pretty sure that. The mathematical foundations that you gave uh, will help help them better understand the other talks as well, and that was the goal. Okay, yes. I don't see I don't see questions uh, now. So uh, thank you once again, Dr. Mandar. It was a pleasure to to listen to your talk, uh, and I, I can see that we already have the second speaker with us, uh, Tomasz uh, Robotycki. So Tomasz, uh, if you are ready, you can try to share your screen. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Where is the option here? Share screen. There's okay. This, uh, green button. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I've got it. Uh, and I want to share this one. I'm sharing the whole screen because I have the video to show you in the middle of the presentation. So that uh, that's it would fine. be faster, I believe. Uh, can yeah, you see that's... two things? Like, first thing is the presentation, second thing is my face, and the third thing is my cursor. Can you see all of those? <laughs> Yes, I at, at least I can see. <laughs> yeah, perfect. Okay. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, so can I uh, begin? Uh, yes, yes, we are on time, so we can start. Yes. Okay. So oh, perfect, uh, guys. Okay, today I will talk with you about training quantum neural networks with metacaristics, and I will briefly talk about uh, the why it has to be. I mean, has to be done. What it can be done. Why we should do it. Maybe what the quantum neural networks are. What the the 
meta characteristics are on the like example of the particle swarm optimization uh, meta characteristic. Then I will briefly uh, talk about the methodology of the experiments we we have done. I mean we because I'm doing this work with Piotr Gavron. Uh, uh, do, at this work, and then I will talk about the experimental results and the conclusion from the talk. Okay, so like uh, as you may know, uh, quantum machine learning. Uh, <laughs> the conference is about quantum machine learning, so I assume you know, but let me repeat that. It's a combination of uh, like or maybe using quantum techniques in machine learning stuff. So basically, there is a lot that we can do because we have like you know this additional. Uh, resources that we can use this this uh, superposition or or entanglement for example so there is you know a lot that we can a lot of new things that we can do with with quantum in machine learning but there are obviously some challenges namely that the, the current devices are like not available at all of the times because you know we have to share them with with each other like for example the IBM devices uh, and they are also the error prone, to be honest. So, so there is a lot to to be done there. And like um, one may think, when when we are talking about quantum computations at all, that there may be some quantum advantage in this stuff. But actually, there are some works that I, for example, quote here. This is a quote from Maria Schult that uh, the quantum advantage may not really be the case like or or the right goal for quantum machine learning. But it is nonetheless an interesting field. Uh, if it comes to quantum neural networks, like which is a part of uh, a part of uh, quantum machine learning, it's obvious that that we have to have some uh, description of those. It, it, we are usually doing them with the usual quantum circuit uh, depiction. Here is not really a quantum neural network because there are no parameters in the case that I show you here. But maybe it would be good for you to understand how uh, how we show quantum computations in this uh, usual gate uh, gate model of computations. So basically, what we have here, there are qubits in some states. Usually, we start with the zero state in the computational basis. And then we apply some gates like according to the or order of those gates in the, in the circuit. So first, we will apply Hadamard gate to Q0 here. Then we apply the C0 gate on the Q1. Uh, controlled by Q0, and then we apply Hadamard gate to Q1 in this particular example. So, so quantum neural network would look similar to that. I will talk about it later uh, in the talk. And what's cool here is that, uh, as I stated, we can use this entanglement, we can use the superposition applied by the Hadamard gate, and this is like a uh, very use useful resource in computations. And uh, basically, the structure is kind. Uh, the structure of the neural networks, which I will talk about uh, in a, a little later, is basically similar to neural networks in such sense that we have some weights, we have something that we can like, kind of think of about like of neurons, but uh, but not really. And you will see in a second. And the classical meta characteristic. What are those like? Uh, I would assume that most of you have some background in physics, and on, in physics, we don't really uh, touch this subject too much. Uh, so meta characteristics are uh, uh, basically, it's, it's, you can think of those as a solvers for some optimization problem that you use where you have no idea how to proceed with your problem. So basically, you have this large search space, and you would like to find an optimal solution for a function or think of it like a like a minimum of a function okay and and the, the space is too large for for you to to brute force this this issue so what you would do is you would for example run this particle swarm optimization algorithm so so you will just uh, 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 you will just uh, place a lot of particles or a lot like i mean like some of the particles some of the agents around the search space and you would allow them to run freely around the space with some, you know, order that I will talk about in a second. And it, it, hopefully, at some point, they will try. Uh, they will uh, uh, converge in some uh, minima. Okay. Um, so, so there is that. When it comes to to, to using uh, 
meta heuristics in generally in machine learning, it has been done uh, a lot actually. Uh, science, science, even the uh, actually 80s is the the time when the artificial neural networks start to be interesting again, and then in the you know this deep learning boom again in 2010. But uh, but what I am talking about here. Using the the, the meta heuristics to train uh, artificial neural networks are the thing from the '90s, I believe, and that we can still do. Like like in the '90s, there was show that the genetic algorithm, by the, the work by Montana, uh, could be used to train classical artificial neural networks. Um, but due to some advancements, you know, the, this 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 uh, uh, deep learning and uh, and quantum machine learning stuff, it's still a very interesting area to, to research. And there are a lot of comparative studies that are saying how to use, uh, how to train classical artificial neural networks. And this is interesting to us because usually when it's done classically, we can, with you know some, some modifications, uh, use it also to quantum. Therefore, such, such works are a, a great deal for us. OK. If it comes to, to, to training a quantum neural network, which we still don't know what it is, but I will you know, talk about it in a second, uh, usually you apply gradient-based methods. So, so it, it, this is a, a machine learning 101, like how to use the, the, this gradient descent uh, or gradient descent related algorithms to, to, uh, to, to train a neural network. But uh, there are some maybe more, uh, uh, fancy approaches also like this quantum uh, search base algorithm that's using Grover algorithm for for a for for a training. But what is important to us and what is important for this talk that uh, meta heuristics aren't really discussed that much in the literature when com when it comes to quantum machine learning, and I believe that is uh, not good because uh, as you will see soon, they can give pretty good results when doing so. And you know when they are doing those meta heuristics, or generally when when we are talking about quantum machine learning, uh, the training section of the of the talk, so 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 the idea how you train the, this quantum neural network isn't really discussed in much detail in the work. So basically, uh, even if you find a work when you are saying, okay, so I trained my quantum neural network or whatever model with meta heuristics, you will just say, okay, I did it with PSO without any discussion about how you uh, took the hyperparameters and such and such. So, so this is a, a little gap in the in the uh, uh, literature, if you please. And uh, the, I believe that uh, we would benefit greatly if we fill that gap. Um, yeah, so, okay. Mm, 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 mm. So, okay, let us proceed. Finally, what are those quantum neural networks? So, uh, uh, quantum neural networks, like, uh, would be, um, is what we do is we take artificial neural network, the, the simplest one, so, so that the uh, perceptron, the feed forward neural network, and we are asking how can we modify those artificial neural networks so that we can apply this. Uh, all this quantum stuff, this superposition and entangling and uh, stuff uh, to it. So with some rephrasing of the problem, we can see that on, only thing what we would need to do is basically somehow allow our circuit to be parameterized by weights of some kind and by, uh, and by the inputs, right? So that's exactly what we'll do. We are taking something called the variational quantum circuits. And we would say that our variational quantum circuits, given the weights and uh, and the uh, input, so the parameters of the circuit, would be our uh, quantum neural network. And given that, given that we have some weights here, we can now see that this be this can be rephrased as an optimization problem, right? Because we are trying to find an optimal set of weights that would allow us to perform a task that we are meaning for our network to do, right? So that's very good for from the context of, of uh, applying 
metacoristics for this problem. And that's uh, like a very usual way to think of about the networks. Like you can see how quantum neural networks and artificial neural networks, the classical ones, relate to each other, right? So there's this, this very like general scheme of how variational quantum circuit looks like it can be depicted in this picture, right? So we are applying, we have these qubits here, usually in the state zero, as I mentioned uh, before, but uh, I, I didn't bother with, with showing that on the picture. And then we apply some unitary and some other unitary. The first one is based on the input vector. And the second one will be, uh, uh, will be, uh, will depend on the weights or the angles. Because what we are doing is basically we've got some gate that rotates the cu qubits, right? This is the idea here. And we obviously can apply it an arbitrary number of times uh, with having uh, a deeper and deeper and deeper circuit each time. But if we are doing this stuff on the real machines, the one thing to remember is that with the great depth of the circuit comes the great error accumulation. Therefore, we cannot do it like uh, to the infinity, right? OK. But in this talk, I will not talk about the, the, the real quantum device. I will just talk about the simulations. Right. So the particle swarm optimization. Uh, particle swarm optimization is the population-based metacoristic. So that, as I the, the briefly skipped on it before, you just place some agents in the search space, and you are you want the, the agents to move around, talk with each other, and find the and find the uh, some some uh, kind of maxima or minima of the function that you are looking for, right? Um, this is. Uh, relatively old concept because the, the the work is from the I want to say 90s but I'm not 100% sure now. Uh, basically, you can just check the the the, the reference and, and see for yourself. This is old, and because this is old, it's uh, well researched. Okay, there are a lot of the variations of the particles form optimization like this. You know the so-called uh, uh, natural base metacoristics when you are saying okay, so instead of some arbitrary particles, like take some like uh, firefly mating uh, the, the, uh, characteristics and apply some basically some additional parameters to the PSO and and we'll have a process that describes this this fireflies mating process. We'll call it a firefly algorithm that will work in such a such way. Uh, uh, there is something like that with the bees, with the bats, with whatever you like. There's a whole book about this natural base metacoristic, which is basically the modification of the PSO. But the basic idea is that you have some particles. The particles will have some velocity that will update in each iteration and some position up. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so the velocity update will, will be given. and. Uh, don't look at the, the the formulas that much. What is important here is that you will the, the velocity is based basically on the uh, pos the best position of the that the particle was in. Uh, the best position is the one that had the best fitness value, and the fitness value is the, the your target function basically. So if you are looking for minima of a function, uh, the best position would be the uh, position uh, location in the search space that attain the minimal value for the function that we are looking at, okay? Looking to minimize. This is the global best positions, meaning that uh, that uh, uh, we are looking at also at the other particles and trying to, to go to the best one. And, you know, uh, we have the velocity, uh, our position, and such and such. such. So, so this is like uh, simple stuff. Uh, the position update is basically in each iteration, go one velocity away from the your current position. This is uh, nothing fancy. Uh, and uh, I will show you how it works in a second. Uh, and the idea of the PSO is that basically, OK, so you are in some position. You evaluate this position. You are looking at all other particles. Like, you evaluate for each other. You're looking where we are in the context of the best solution. And we go into the some. we tend to go into the direction of the best one. OK? And we do it iteratively. We move, and we by by moving, we 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 traverse through the search space so that we find the the, the best solution that we can. Uh, in the context of training the quantum neural network, or neural network in general, it was shown that PSO can do very well when training the artificial neural network. Again, this was the work by Montana, but but some uh, later one. 
uh, later in the con uh, context of what I mentioned. And there is a high possibility, given that we can rephrase like this problem of uh, artificial neural network weight searching uh, in the same way as we can do with quantum neural networks. So we are here we are looking for weights, and here we are looking for weights. There is a high probability, or there was a high probability, because I have shown that it can be done, uh, that we can uh, apply the same technique to quantum neural networks. So OK. I, I promise a video presentation, so there it is. Uh, let me just okay. Uh, can you see my picture? Uh, the 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 video now. Like it's not moving yet, but uh... I can so... see it. Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so this will be the particle swarm optimization that is looking to minimize the. Uh, this is the target. This is the minima of the function. It's basically the the. Uh, at the length, how far you are from the center of the of the two-dimensional space. Okay, I'm running the video now. In each iteration, what we can see is that the particles tend to go into the middle, close to the to the uh, target function. And after the ten iteration, basically, right now we are just having this 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 random random. Uh, noise, like just going around the, the, the minima, the global minima of the problem, right? This is a simple example, like simple graphical one, so that you know uh, that you can see that they uh, converge near the near the minima. And uh, that's that's basically the idea of how it works. So so you've you've got some search space to cover, you cover it, and then you by by talking with other particles see where you should go and you you arrive at the at the minima that we are looking for. And that's the PSO for you. Basically, that's 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 anything there. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. Okay, so we conducted some experiments to see whether the 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 uh, this uh, hypothesis that the uh, uh, PSO algorithm can be used for uh, for training quantum neural networks is good. And uh, we had to, you know, get something. Uh, talk about some stuff first. So, quantum neural network architecture was will be the first uh, thing I will talk about, and it basically means that we had to get the structure of the of the uh, of the circuit somehow of this quantum neural network. So. Um, in order to use our algorithm, we decided that we will take the number of the input parameters, input qubits, or the qubits in the, the, the whole of whole circuit, to be equal to the uh, number of uh, parameters in the data set that we use. Okay. Uh, this is like not necessarily the case. You, you can code the information on the qubit in a various way, but this is the like conceptually the simplest one because what you are doing is you basically, when you have the parameter, you just rotate the qubit. Uh, sorry, okay, right now, you can rotate the qubit in such a way that it corresponds to the 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 angle of the rotation will be will depend on the value of the of the uh, of the parameter, right? So you basically if if it's maximal, you will rotate it from zero to one, and if it's like somewhere in between, you will go somewhere in between. That's easy as that. We obviously use the quantum multilayer perceptron multilayer, meaning that that we have uh, a lot of those uh, of of those a, a lot meaning like three, I believe, or four in the circuits that we we check. So so there is not a uh, not that much of the particles, but there is quite some of them. Like like the number of the uh, of weights is like thirty or something like that. So it's not that small. And what is very important here is that we had the fixed uh, variational quantum circuit structure for all of the experiments, meaning that uh, when we'll be comparing with other training methods. We always train the same circuit, and we always have the same initialization. Okay, so that this is hopefully uh, just for all of the uh, all of the training methods. Now, as for the data sets, uh, 
so far we use the common ones for the binary uh, optimization. So we've got the iris and the moon's data set. Um, okay, uh, some of you may argue that iris has three classes. Yes, it does. But what we did was we took two of them that are linearly separable just to you know have some 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 trivial uh, trivial uh, binary optimization test. Basically, that was the idea. And the moons cannot be uh, linearly separable. Therefore, uh, I believe I forgot to add the, the picture of the moons. So moons is basically if you have one moon like like this, you know, half circle, and then you have another half circle so that they quite intersect on on some intersect meaning that like, like intersect is a bit of a stretch but you get the idea from what i'm trying to show you um the, the, therefore they are not linearly separable and it's a harder task to do um yeah so we've got the usual training test split and we have some initialization they are like randomly distributed over the over the search space have you seen in the picture that i showed you um, maybe one more thing. The important thing here is that given that we are looking for the weights that are uh, rotations, the the search space was uh, limited from zero to pi, okay? Because we only have to rotate it by pi at maximum. Now, uh, what is the velocity and the uh, movement and blah 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 blah? So in the in the this mathematical description of the PSO algorithm, you might have seen the parameters C1 and C2. Those are the hyperparameters of the algorithm. And what we've done is we use the usual uh, value of those parameters, like proposed by the authors of the algorithm, equal to 2. And the fitness evaluation we based on, uh, on uh, the accuracy. So accuracy was the metric that the QNN was trying to maximize. Okay. With the accuracy one indicating that we had the flawless binary classification, zero was the, the worst. Now, we also looked at the F1 score, the precision, and the recall of, of this, because this is, the, those are the usual metrics for, for classification experiments. So, so obviously, we looked at them, but only after it was trained to provide the best accuracy. Okay, So the accuracy is the, 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 the best metric. But as I stressed before, the number of calls to the quantum machine is also a valid and very important metric that is not discussed enough in the literature because um, because uh, this is expensive, right? This is the most expensive uh, stuff in the whole process, basically. So we have to look at it also. And uh, let us go to the, oh, not the results. OK, so so the tools and program. Obviously, we use Python, and there is a code for it somewhere in my uh, in my GitHub. You can easily find it. It's, it's not a problem. Um, so we use Python, Penilane for the uh, QML stuff, the app, oh, DEAP for for the evolutionary stuff. So the particles form evolu uh, optimization is here, and, and a lot of other meta heuristics. This is a great library, really. And obviously, we use uh, scikit-learn for the data set generation and, and this, this usual machine learning stuff, data preprocessing and stuff and stuff. Also, uh, important thing, I forgot to add here, uh, we also used Optuna for hyperparameter optimization for every heuristic that we use and every gradient-based algorithm that we I will show you here. So so uh, we were trying to uh, provide like a common grant for every algorithm that we will compare. I'm getting to the end, so, so don't worry. Uh, OK, so take a look at this. What we have here is uh, F1 score for all the PSO, Adagrad optimizer, Adam optimizer, Grandin descent optimizer, and Ester of momentum optimizer. All of the optimizers here are implemented in Penilane and used as, as implemented without the change, but only after the hyperparameter optimization. And the PSO is the, the, the meta heuristic from the app. As, and you, as you can see, like the PSO outperforms all the other meta heuristics, uh, all the other optimizers, so, so, so the gradient based ones. And it does so for basically uh, every, every figure of merit here. So for the accuracy, for the recall, and for the precision. Like, okay, you, you can argue that there are some uh, precisions uh, achieved by the gradient stuff. Okay, but uh, you will probably see why on the next slide because there is the cost comparison. 
as, as you can see, meta characteristics are really cheap in the number of calls to the quantum machine. Like, you may not see what, what's written here. Uh, the, I've got my Python opened on the next window. It says that uh, on average, we had like 700 calls in comparison to 100K and above. So you, you, you can get the gist of how, how computationally cheaper metacoristics are. OK, so let's go to the conclusion. I am actually, let me maybe state one thing. I am very skeptical about the, the 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 our results because like this is a huge gap between the uh, cost and the accuracy of the of the stuff. So so I believe that we have to conduct some more experiments. But uh, as for now, what I believe that we have shown in the paper in the in this work in particular, that uh, meta heuristics are effective at least for some uh, some uh, specific circuits. And there is more research to be done on this. They are surely cost effective, meaning that even if we find out that it's not good to use meta heuristics for like general training, maybe it is good to use them in the initial stages of the training so that you know you have some good idea where the weights should be, and then you just run the, the usual gradient-based optimization. Um and yeah, so 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 there is that. Also, uh, uh, there are future research directions so that basically you can only focus on comprehensive experimentation of this because what we have to do is we have to test a lot of other stuff. So a lot of other meta heuristics, possibly different data sets, different structures of the variational quantum circuits. And all of that is to better understand this uh, proportion of accuracy to the calls, the, this gap in, the, in this proportion, because I believe that there is something there. Those experiments that that, that that I showed you, I actually thought initially that this is an error. And we rerun those. We checked the weights obtained by the meta heuristics and by all of those uh, gradient-based algorithms by hand. And they seem to work as stated on the figure. So, so we have to get down to this. I, I have no idea why why there is such a gap, but, but uh, some experiments have to be done. OK, and that's it for me. OK, great. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Thank Let's you. see if we have some questions. Uh, there's one question, or mm -hmm. no, actually two questions on our chat. Uh, so does uh, particle swarm optimization also find the better minimas in general compared to gradient-based methods? Oh, uh, I have no idea. Like, it, it can happen that if you use particle swarm optimization or generally meta heuristics, that they can get stuck in the local minima. That can happen. But you have to know that it mostly happens because of the, the wrong distribution of the particles in the whole system, right? Because if you, for example, Imagine that uh, I have some uh, function with the local minima and the global one, okay? And if I initialize all the particles close to the local minima, I would imagine that they will get stuck in there, okay? But uh, but aside from that, uh, you should spread them so that they don't get stuck in the local minima and therefore should go towards the, the global one. And so I believe that... Uh, in the mm -hmm. end, uh, the, it's it's comparative with the gradient one, mm -hmm. like in the in the, the general, general case. Okay, there's an interesting question from Dr. Mander. Does using PSO reduce the possibility of barren plateaus? Uh, great question. And I have to say that I'm not 100% sure because there are some works that suggested that meta heuristics can help with the barren plateau problem. Correct. But but uh, but also there was this argument made a year or two ago that the meta heuristic doesn't solve the problem. I didn't. I actually wanted to go into that during my talk, but I didn't have time to really look into this paper again, so I don't re remember quite that much. The, uh, the latest latest argument in that field was saying that meta heuristics do not help with the Baron Plato problem. 
Uh, but you okay. might actually uh, ask uh, the next speaker because Mateusz has done some work in this mm -hmm. field. So. <laughs> okay. So so now I I will have the question to to both of you to Thomas and to Mateusz because uh, now is the time for the first for the third talk. But uh, it seems that we have two more questions. So uh, Thomas, is it fine for you to answer two more questions that we have? On the, the chat and if, if and Mateusz, is fine with it. Mateusz, is it fine for you to st maybe start a few minutes later? Yes, yes, no problem. Okay, good. So I will read uh, another question. Uh, from the question from Talher. Currently, I work in the field of uh, natural language processing, where the predominant architecture is transformers. Do optimizations in quantum machine learning and quantum neural network architectures contribute to improvements in our field? Additionally, are there quantum versions of optimizers like Adam? Uh, which leverage quantum tunneling to reduce training time. Okay, so so uh, if it comes to the second part of the question, as you can see, I use the Adam kind of optimizer. So I believe we've got that one covered. And when it comes to natural language processing and, and, and quantum stuff, there is an interesting uh, uh, works done by, uh, by Dr. Koch, I believe, uh, or C O E K E K E, some some something like that. I, I'm not sure how how to how to write his name. Uh, and uh, basically, that the work is related to Z X calculus, and 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 the statement is that uh, you can use Z X calculus to express the not uh, the 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 the. the the structure of the language, so to speak. I, I'm not really familiar with those words. I only know the gist of how, how to proceed with that because I was trying to get into the ZX calculus. Uh, so you can look around those parts, but but that's as much as I can tell because I'm not uh, mm -hmm. very well uh, versed with the natural language processing. Okay, great, thank you. And the last question from Ioannis, could you please explain a little more on how you got the equation of the velocity? Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, it's not what I've got. It's like the statement of the mm -hmm. PSOL definition, but we can look at it uh, surely. So the velocity. What is happening here? When we want to update the velocity, we are looking at the current velocity, or, or right? And we modify it by some kind of weight, right? So, so this is the inertia, basically parameter. This is one of the hyperparameters of the algorithm. Uh, then what you do is you are looking at the, imagine I'm particle. So I'm looking at my best position and at the globally best position, like achieved in, in general. And I tend to, given my, way, uh, my velocity, and this is the target, I would like to go towards the target a little bit. So in each iteration, I would just this is the idea, okay, of, of modifying the velocity. And this is obviously modified by coefficients and by some random uh, random coefficient, random numbers from zero to one, obviously, that I didn't write it here. But 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 that's the gist of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, thanks. Uh, there's one more question from Michal about uh, the paper that you uh, consider the best introduction to quantum tunneling, but maybe you can try to answer on the chat you or maybe some other speakers, uh, because I think it's good to to proceed to Mateusz yeah, sure. now. But but Tomasz, if you want, if it's fast, then you can you can answer now yeah, as well. Yeah, I, I but... will do it on, on yeah, no, I will okay, do it on the great. chat because we are on the time. <laughs> yes, thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tomasz. Thanks for understanding. Uh, and uh, Mateusz, uh, if you are ready, you can try to share your slides as well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So share this. And this one. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your slides, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. Okay, so um, uh, hello. My name is Mateusz Staszewski, and um, I'm postdoc at Warsaw University of Technology. And today I will give a brief introduction uh, to quantum architecture search methods and the challenges I think they face. Um, yeah, so I think um, I will start from uh, like general view. So um, first of all, the quantum architecture search falls under the domain 
of uh, hybrid quantum algorithms where classical and quantum computers interact um, synergistically. So the classical computer um, prepares um, some quantum program, of course, and then uh, this quantum program is implemented on quantum computer. Um, subsequently, you know, we execute this program and read the results, uh, which serve as an input to the uh, classical computer to generate new program, right? So this is like the general uh, scope of this hybrid um, uh, quantum classical approach. And <clears throat> this iterative interaction between classical and quantum computers characterize the essence of the quantum architecture search, enhancing the collaborative power of classical uh, computer and, and quantum computer, right? So to go more into the details, an, an example of such an uh, algorithm are the variational, is the variational quantum Eigen solver. Uh, so in the context of um, VQE, uh, the algorithm's objective is to find a ground state of given you know, Hamiltonian observable that's where usually we map the problem with this in the, in the within this uh, Hamiltonian, this observable. And uh, initially on classical computer, we per, prepare again the quantum program represented, for example, from, from uh, by uh, some parameters theta for, for example, given for a given quantum circuit. We will a little, a little bit more about quantum circuit later. For now, for example, have classical computer prepare some parameters, and based on those parameters, um, like we um, execute the specified quantum circuit on quantum computer, and then so we have uh, we prepared some quantum state. We perform the measurement. Uh, we uh, estimate the expectation value uh, with respect to the state and the observable. And this is the feedback for classical computer to prepare new uh, parameters, new program. Yes, so as I mentioned, uh, we have the quantum program. Um, I'm, by, by quantum program, I mean the quantum circuit. So this is the, for, on the slide, we have an exemplary quantum circuit. Um, this is the, the quantum circuit is a description of the um, some evolution of the quantum state. Uh, in this case, uh, we parameterize this evolution with some uh, fixed gate set of uh, gate set where of, of two qubit uh, uh, C naught gates and one qubit rotation gates. But of course, this is this is the some particular case. Of course, we. You can uh, choose some other gate site. And um, we can this formalize this, this, this uh, circuit description as a product of those um, elementary operations. Um, and finally, when we're preparing the circuit, our goal is to uh, find the, the parameter state vector psi according to the observable age. So in other words, we want to, for example, minimize, for in, in the case of variational quantum Eigen solver, we want to minimize this expression. So find the uh, Eigen vector, which minimize the, uh, this, 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 this expression. Um, I think uh, we had some um, introduction to this on, on, on the first lecture that this observable Hamiltonian we can uh, express by poly matrices. I think there was some uh, information about the poly matrices. Um, so yeah, this is this is only the notation uh, that we can use to, to model the observable. And finally, yes, what do we expect? What are the expectations with respect to this to those quantum circuits? So when we are designing an appropriate uh, circuit architectures, we want circuit to be expressive. So what do we mean by expressive? 
mean that it will be capable to covering as much of the Hilbert sp space as possible. Moreover, uh, the circuit should be trainable, so meaning it has practical potential for optimization using uh, tractable methods on quantum devices. Tractable concerning like the total number of parameters and uh, the lands landscape structure. <clears throat> So in practice, a good architecture should be expressive enough to approximate our ground state. However, it should not be overly expressive, making the search uh, for the ground state uh, intractable. And naturally, finding the right ar architecture is not a, it's, it's a hard combinatorial problem. But also we are facing some other challenges uh, with respect to quantum computers. And by those challenges, I mean noise. And those, uh, those uh, the, 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 the presence of the noise uh, introduces additional constraints to our architecture search methods. For example, um, we want to minimize the depth of the uh, constructed circuit. For example, we can say that we want to minimize the number of two qubit gates. We need, we know that we need them to 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 create an uh, expressive circuit. But on the other hand, uh, we know that the two qubit gates constitute more noise than, for example, one qubit gates. And of course, everything like the estimation of the energy. Is also not trivial. Also, the optimization of those continuous parameters is not trivial. For example, because of the measurements, like we have to choose uh, smartly which optimization method should we uh, choose to 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 our algorithm, to our VQE algorithm. And yes, the. <laughs> the key methodological trends in quantum architecture search. So in deep learning, achieving good model performance often involves selecting an appropriate architecture. However, this process requires extensive knowledge and costly experiments to propose a well-performing neural network. Therefore, um, researchers have developed various methods to uh, automate the process of constructing a suitable architecture. These techniques fall under the umbrella called neural architecture search. And many, many of those techniques of these techniques are being explored for the task of quantum circuit uh, construction. And here we have a list of the several approaches like the differentiable quantum architecture search. <clears throat> reinforcement learning uh, based methods, sampling based uh, learning algorithm and evolutionary algorithm. Um, I'm not sure, maybe sampling based methods and evolutionary methods, those, those I think they are very similar, but yeah, I, I wrote like that's a separate uh, uh, group of methods. Um, I will introduce only the first two approaches and also very briefly because like those are um, like huge fields of the like huge families of the methods. So I think I can only give you uh, some brief sketch of, of, of the idea about the differentiable uh, quantum architecture search and the reinforcement learning based method. Sorry. So uh, different, differentiable uh, quantum architecture search is built on the idea of uh, losing the relaxing, the assumption uh, about the discrete search space. So we were trying to uh, map the search, uh, discrete uh, search space to the continuous uh, space. Uh, this enable us to use the gradient based methods for the architecture search. So we have a predefined, a predefined uh, set of uh, gates, uh, G, and uh, we have uh, some set of the quantum uh, registers, 
Okay, so then we have a full operator pool where we have like some type of the gates and the register where do we want to put given the gate, right? And this, this operator pool is a discrete uh, set. And then as I mentioned, uh, DQAS uh, maps uh, this discrete operator pool into the probabilistic um, distribution, this is the probabilistic mode. And uh, this means that each elementary operation assigned uh, is assigned a probability expressed as follows, right? So for probability of uh, gate uj on the on some um, uh, on some uh, register l is expressed uh, with, uh, for example, this uh, formula of probability, and in general the full circuit, right, which is composed of the some m uh, gates, we can express with uh, this uh, probabilistic uh, model. Then, uh, therefore, the objective function for this DQAS is the following form. So this is like the um, sum over the our cost function. We remember that the, in this variational uh, Inge solver formula, uh, that was the our objective. The input state, the given cir circuit sampled from our uh, distribution, uh, the the observable. And uh, so on. And general um, graph of the of the algorithm. So classical. Firstly, the classical computer uh, prepares the parameters uh, alpha uh, for the probability distribution. Uh, next, we randomly draw a batch of circuits uh, according to this uh, distribution. Next, so we have like the batch of the different uh, circuits. Next, we evaluate the loss function. Um, of course, uh, probability distribution uh, determines the only the architecture. So still we have the continuous parameters. So also we have to to properly evaluate the, the our our circuits. We have to update and optimize the circuits. You know, the parameters of the circuits. Um, and finally, based on the, on the computed uh, loss function, uh, we classical computer determines new parameters alpha. So in the end, um, the, the, the goal is to find the distribution that will course, minimize the loss function, right? So to maximize the probability of drawing the uh, circuits, which will uh, minimize the loss function. And this is like the only, as I mentioned, only the uh, sketch of this, of, of, of this, of the idea of these methods. Like, as, as, as I know, there is a, um, a few new papers with some subroutines, with, with some techniques of parameter sharing, uh, which are trying to make those methods more sample efficient so that we don't have to um, update constantly those uh, theta parameters um, and some using some subroutines to make those methods more scalable. Um, yes, okay, so this is this is like the brief uh, brief um, introduction about the differential quantum architecture search. And now I would like to uh, tell you a few words about um, reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning in general, it's, it's a, a, a lear, machine learning algorithm uh, based on the interaction of the agent with the environment. So agent um, performs on some action being on given state of the environment. So after the action state changes, so we have new state and also, so agent receives the information about the new state and also um, about new, about the reward. So agent interacting with the environment changes the state 
and receives the reward. Um, of course, the, the, the aim of the agent is to maximize the collected rewards. So how it relates to our quantum architecture search, we can imagine that our state will be a quantum circuit. Agent, agent's action is to uh, add to circuit some new gate, as you can see uh, on the example. Then we have new state, so new circuit. We can evaluate our expectation value. Based on the expectation value, we can prepare the reward, which will be the input, uh, uh, which will be the, the information about the progress uh, for the agent, right? We can try use that di di use directly the estimated energy, or we can map this energy via some function to 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 in improve the signal uh, from the reward. And this is like also like I guess huge problem on of reinforcement learning, this uh, reward engineering. So how to design proper reward. But yeah, this is one thing that um, I, I'm trying to point point out that yeah, this is this is sometimes not trivial. Uh, what what kind of reward should we use in this um, quantum architecture search problem? Um, so let's define uh, define the fundamental concepts. I I think I I. I gave you some uh, intuition about those, but in the formalism. Uh, of, of reinforcement learning, the, the basic is the Markov decision problem. So the tuple, uh, and in this then in this formalis, we need to uh, have a state space. So as I mentioned in our uh, quantum architecture search problem, it could be the uh, the, the the space of the 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 all the, all the circuits, the action space, for example, the the gate set. So uh, possible gate which agent can um, apply and the state uh, transition for probability so this is the probability that when agent is in a given state uh, and it will uh, perform given action then there, there is some probability that it will change the state to some uh, new state right and then we have intermediate rewards, so the, also the function based on the state and the action, uh, the, the function which, which returns us the, the, the reward. Therefore, the agent um, performs actions according to the policy pi modeled by the conditional probability. So the uh, policy, uh, when we are in given state S, uh, it's, it's models the by via probability that we will take the next action, some given some action at, um, and then considering uh, some episode in which the agent takes some t actions, uh, it traverses a certain trajectory, right? So it starts in the state s zero perform action A0, and cetera, and reach some um, final state. Or we'll, we're saying that this is the maximal number of action that we can perform, and this is the end. Then we can evaluate how well the agent performed by calculating the cumulative reward collected during the training. Right? So we have the all the sum some of the all the rewards collected in this trajectory. And we have here additional factor gamma, and this parameter gamma controls how greedy agents should be. So if gamma is close to zero or even equal to zero, then uh, agent is very greedy because in each action, uh, agent is interested only in the next reward or how much uh, agent values the long-term return. So when gamma is close to one, or even when gamma is equal to one, then all the rewards uh, matter equal, right? 
okay? And then the objective function for given policy uh, is expressed as um, expected return. So for given policy pi, um, we compute the expectation value uh, of the returns with respect to the trajectories which are sampled from our policy. So like here we have uh, some of the trajectories and the trajectories are sampled from our policy pi, right? So here this this here this project project uh, product um, uh, corresponds to to this uh, expected uh, return respect to this uh, policy pi. And the optimal policy, so with respect to this uh, uh, objective, the goal of reinforcement learning is to find a policy that maximizes our uh, expected return. And um, one method to achieve this goal is to use um, value functions that uh, model the expected return. So um, does the action value function uh, models the expected return for a given uh, state and action? As you can see, this is a special function that models for given policy pi. It models this expected, um, expected uh, uh, return starting from given state S uh, and A, right? So thanks to this function, when we are, for example, even in the middle of the trajectory, we are able to evaluate our expected outcome starting from this particular state, uh, state, state and, and picking this particular action. Um, And therefore, by selecting, um, ah, okay, sorry. So without delving into the uh, details, the optimal policy leads to the uh, optimal action value, right? So we have the optimal action action value function corresponds uh, to the corresponds to, to optimal policy. So again, the, this is the maximization of the over the po all the policies uh, 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 and maximization of the expected return, and because uh, based on this, when we are taking um, by selecting a, an action that maximizes the optimal value action value function, we act according to the optimal policy, right? So this is this is based on the Bellman equation rule, and this is the base for the uh, Q-learning method. So, given the approximation of our expected return, we are trying to uh, always pick the action which will maximize given state, maximize the uh, our uh, action value function. And of course, uh, trying to incorporate the those, uh, modern techniques like uh, deep learning, so we can approximate this Q function with neural network. Like in base formula, this Q function for each state and action uh, and early uh, concept, it was represented by a table, right? Because we have like the columns of states and rows of actions. And um, it, in each um, uh, box, we had we tried to uh, have the this this uh, expected return. But of course, for large state space or action space, it was intractable. Therefore, uh, uh, people tried to use a neural network to approximate this expected um, uh, return. So here we have the the neural network with trainable parameters oh this is this is unfortunate there's also i have theta but those are the should be the parameters of of neural classical neural network 
and um, the objective is the minimizing the uh, temporal difference error. So um, our objective in this um, in training, this uh, few action value function is to minimize uh, this type of loss mean square error where we have um, the uh, yj is the uh, next reward plus the maximal, the, 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 the next, we, we evaluate the q function in the next state and uh, we, we will pick the action which maximizes this expression, right? Of course, because this is the uh, Q function of the next state, we are discounting it, discounting it with our gamma uh, factor, yes? Because as I mentioned, um, Q function um, models the expected uh, return. So as you can see, uh, next reward is discounted by this factor gamma. So because the next uh, uh, reward, like the, ne the, the the expected outcome from the next state should be discounted by gamma. And therefore, we are trying to train our neural network that it will gradually, gradually uh, model the uh, expected uh, outcome um, which will maximize the, the Q function. So this via, via this rule, we have the, 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 this is the rule corresponding to this uh, optimal action, right? From this, uh, from this formula. So our objective is to maximize the Q function. So we always want to pick the action that maximizes this. And in the end, our goal is to find the function that will model this uh, this this uh, expected return with respect to the optimal policy. And um, yes, so this is, yeah, I guess very, very brief um, um, sketch of the of this deep Q learning and the reinforcement learning uh, methods. Um, yes, and like, um, I, I think maybe I, I will go to the, to the conclusions, um, yeah, because, for example, we have some technical challenges, uh, which um, are also valid for the reinforcement learning, or especially, for example, there is a question, how can we, how we should represent the quantum circuits, because the representation of quantum circuits has an impact, for example, on the neural network, which we will use, because you can try to represent quantum circuit as a graph, then maybe we should use some graph neural network, maybe by, by some tensors, then maybe convolutional neural networks. This is not obvious what, what which uh, uh, choice will be suboptimal. Also, this is an interesting uh, question, how can we encode information about the Hamiltonian? Because it would be nice if we, our method could generalize or transfer the knowledge to some other uh, problems. But because of uh, to, to, to generalize or to transfer knowledge, we have to incorporate the, the, the information about Hamiltonian. And this is also not obvious how to do this. Um, but I think that the ultimate goal is uh, the study of the training cost and cost scaling uh, with respect to, to, to understand the applicability uh, uh, of those methods on larger systems, right? Because right now we are first working on, on toy models which are able to, uh, which are able to simulate, uh, but our ultimate goal is to prepare, to propose the method that will work, really will work uh, in, in large scale, right? And this is still most of those methods or all of those methods are like uh, only heuristics, right? So we, we never have guarantee uh, that they will work. Um, and I think like to sum up the desired proprietors of quantum architecture search, the sample efficiency. So we want to reduce uh, quantum computer queries, the scalability, uh, so that to accommodate to larger qubit uh, system and the uh, generalization or, or knowledge transfer, as I mentioned, this is also 
something that I, I guess combines both previous both uh, points, right? Because if you are able to transfer the knowledge, there is a chance that we will be more efficient uh, on, on larger um, systems and maybe we'll be more sample efficient. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you, Mateusz. Um, yeah, so we have a delay now, so I can see only one question on the chat. So let me ask uh, this one question. And if there are more questions, you can maybe later pause them on the chat. And uh, if Mateusz stays with us, uh, he mm -hmm. can try to answer. So the question is, can you kind of explain more on the cost function used to find better trainable expressible circuits? How to quantify the trainability expressibility required to des for designing cost functions? Yes, yes. Um, this is, I guess, this is this is um, difficult question to be honest because yes, those I think those are a little bit abstract concept, right? Because uh, evaluation of how circuit is um, expressive. I think we can do this, but I'm not sure if this is um, something that we want to do, right? Because in the end, for example, I think, for example, with, with this trainability, what I, in my experience, for example, so our goal is to find the circuits which will solve particular VQE problem, right? So then if we are able to, uh, solve this, this those problems for example pass the chemical uh, accuracy in in in, in uh, finding a gr ground state then we know that uh, circuit is expressive enough and trainable enough because we've done it right but of course this we done it on on toy model that also we we are able to check if what is the real real energy compare the, the the results and and evaluate that yes we we pass the chemical accuracy but in general um how can we be sure that that the circuit is trainable uh and uh, expressive enough this is a tough question yeah I, I i i'm not sure how to do this of course incorporating those some other objectives which are trying to mitigate the the noise effects this is easier because of the depth the the reduction of number of gates but expressivity yeah this is an interesting question and i'm not sure what is that um can i can i add a point over here i think there yes. are some papers by sukin Sen and others on expressibility and uh, not necessarily trainability but expressibility of uh, circuit mm -hmm. so i think maybe people can refer to those papers i'll probably try to share a link uh oh yeah i don't have it immediately with me. i can do that yeah Okay, okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Dr. Mander. All right, thanks, yeah. uh, thanks also, Mateusz, for for answering the question. Uh, yeah, uh, we are delayed, so let's go to the next talk. Uh, it will be given by Manish Modani from Nvidia. Uh, so, Manish, if you are ready, you can uh, try to share your slides. All right. I can I see your slides. Uh, yeah, am I audible? Yes, yes, you're audible. So, yeah, we can start. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Pavel. Thanks, uh, thanks to organizers for giving me chance to present here. Um, I'm Manish uh, from Nvidia. Uh, today, would like to discuss about um the HPC and QC, how the hybrid programming will work, and what frameworks are available to make your uh, make the developer's life easier, right? There are many things going on about quantum, like uh, they are uh, limited by number of qubits. If they do go for simulations, if they go for actual quantum computer, they, there that's a limited availability, but then there are more challenge on quantum side, like there could be erroneous results, how many qubits are real, and so many things are there. And those are obvious because field is emerging, and that's where we are here. Uh, where I would like to take uh, this uh, next 20 minutes is uh, uh, what NVIDIA is doing in this and how we can be uh, work with the developers and make their life easier. We, we have the framework, which is one can write the code today, maybe running on simulator, but tomorrow seamlessly can be run on quantum computer. 
that quantum computer can be of any type. Now we talk, we know that there are various kinds of quantum computers coming, their software environments are different, their logics and other things are different, but seamlessly it will run on actual quantum computer whenever it is available, whenever it is ready, today also in limited capacity, but tomorrow also with any other thing, it will be available and ready. So uh, before starting, uh, let me start with the, uh, what is accelerated computing? What is NVIDIA? And we are known for uh, the accelerating the computing, be it in HPC, be it in AI, be it in ML, uh, or nowadays deep learning, chat GPT, Gen AI, everything, we are accelerating all those things, make it possible to have simulations, um, make it possible to solve the unsolved problem and that too in time, right? Uh, next, I would like to discuss about the integration of HPC and quantum computing, why it is essential and where are we. And in that light, I will discuss the CUDA quantum, which is NVIDIA framework and Ku quantum, which is to accelerate your simulation, be it any framework, QuizKids, Cirque, PennyLane, any framework, you can accelerate those simulation using Ku quantum. And CUDA quantum is helpful when one is writing the code in hybrid mode like part of the code is HPC or, or classical system, part of it on uh, quantum system, how they one can write, how one can leverage and what is going on, right? So with that uh, right side, what I am showing is recently the our CEO Jensen visited India and met with the Indian prime minister. And <clears throat> after their discussion, there is a significant discussion going on to have a significant investment in accelerators or GPU, make the computing available for every developers and the work is going on. And as well as uh, we are now the uh, one uh, trillion dollar company, uh, we are in that market cap. <clears throat> so let me introduce in one or two slides what NVIDIA is uh, doing. Uh, there are much more, but I'm trying to capture what we are. NVIDIA started in 1993, uh, started with their graphics card, known initially for graphics card, for gaming, and so on. Uh, you might be seeing on your laptop and other devices, they have the graphics card, which is from NVIDIA. Then slowly, slowly, what happened, we start using those graphics card for number crunching. And number crunching means all our mathematical operations like matrix multiplication and um, just now we discussed the finding the loss function and finding the error and other things. <clears throat> Sorry. So that thing, we developed a layer called CUDA. So CUDA is enabled using those um, uh, graphics card. Earlier we used to say graphics card. Now we say the uh, processing unit. So GPU, graphics processing unit. So that we use. Uh, the CUDA layer above enable us to exploit the capability of GPUs for our scientific computations and our uh, visualizations and other things, right? So NVIDIA was building the earlier the GPU. Now we are manufacturing the CPU also, which is ARM base. And then DPU is data processing unit. We acquired the network side Mellanox and we are uh, giving those DPU in the network, right? So all three things we are manufacturing now. It's not only graphics card, we are giving full GPU, CPU, and DPU. Based on that, various systems are available, like DGX is our proprietary, RTX is ray tracing, HGX is uh, the system where we give our partner, business partner, the graphics card, and they integrate their system. Same with Edge system on cloud, EGX, and then SuperPod is large scale data center, and so on, right? So that is on hardware side what we are doing. Above that, we created the libraries which accelerate the performance of any of uh, code. And those libraries are being used as per the requirement. Same like Triton uh, um, for M, uh, TensorRT. Triton, these are for accelerating the Tensor framework and try implementing those frameworks. Um, same with QDNN. It's a DNN, uh, the library DNN. And same, we accelerate with QDNN. Spark Rapid is for data science. Uh, similarly, C, uh, computer vision CUDA, CV CUDA. Q quantum is for quantum, which I will discuss later. Parabricks is for genomics. And for each domain, I am showing here few only, but there are many libraries which one can easily use, replace like NumPy and QPy. 
So one is using the NumPy, simply replace those things with CuPy, and one can get the accelerated performance on GPU. And then the range of what I'm talking about is order of 50 to 100 to 1000. That much difference in the performance one can achieve. About that, then we realized that developer, why developers should bother to calling the library and bother about hardware and all. We created the, the various frameworks. So now developer can go and use this framework, same like PyTorch, TensorRT and all. These frameworks are being used across the domain. Um, to name it, Modulus is our scientific on, on framework, where for scientific framework, we need uh, that any training that should follow the uh, governing laws like mass conservation and uh, all other scientific laws, right? Conservation of mass, conservation of energy, and so on. So Modulus is the framework which enables those, you know, um, uh, for, uh, the laws to be followed. And accordingly, it is being used in CFD domain by various industry. Now, even in weather forecast and so on. So it is very popular in scientific domain. Um, same with, say, magazine. Magazine is the language translation while one is uh, in the meeting, one is talking in Japanese, other would like to listen, uh, hear in, say, English. So it gives the uh, live translation. Nemo is our framework to um, implement all large language model or Gen AI stuff that is being used. Uh, same with, we can say, Avatar is for 3D. Uh, Drive is for auto drive, Isaac is for robotics, hollow scan is for medical imaging, and so on, right? There are around 300 to 400 frameworks are available. According to uh, every user's requirement or developer's requirement, they can work on these uh, in these frameworks. Uh, they no need to bother the below hardware, any kind of GPU, any kind of CPU. Uh, if the CUDA layer is installed with a uh, given firmware version, which is Generally, those are there. Uh, those frameworks will work and one will get accelerated for performance. So developer's life is becoming easier and we are providing now end-to-end -end platform to work on, uh, to solve the unsolved problem, right? Uh, accordingly, now you will see this GPU computing is across the domain. They are being used. Uh, recently, we had a COVID tough time. But there, you, uh, the simulations during COVID time for drug discovery, um, those are being performed uh, on GPUs, MD code being performed on GPU. So those uh, those kind of things were possible when GPUs were there, right? Uh, I won't go much in, deeper into that, but across the domain, if you see any domain, there the GPUs are being used for auto drive. Many companies we have tie up now. So there the live simulation, I mean live uh, while driving the car, one has to detect what is the object on the road and accordingly to take action. And that's where GPUs are being used. Same even with a square kilometer array in astrophysics, there too much data is coming every second and that data has to be processed and that, that's where uh, the GPUs are being used. So the uh, use cases are enormous and these are being used uh, everywhere. Now, uh, with that, now let's talk the today's topic um, about com quantum computing. So as I said, NVIDIA is to make users, li uh, developers' life easier, make their code faster so that they can solve the unsolved problem, right? With similar thing, we started working in quantum computing. Let me be clear, NVIDIA is not in developing the quantum computer. Uh, we are there for say have an accelerator system or a classical system or high performance computing system, which are GPU enabled. We are there to make integration of quantum computing to high performance computing. Uh, while integrating those make the life easier for the developers. Now let's take one step back before NVIDIA offering. Um, it is almost agreed by across the globe, the scientists that the, any application what we will have in future, that will be hybrid. Hybrid means any code we start, generally uh, that code, initially we have the particular section where IO is there, I mean reading the input data or initializing the array and so on, that will remain on classical. Then the particular section of the code, which we know that that can exploit the quantum computing capabilities, that is usable in our day-to-day -day life or that will give the better performance than classical computer. 
that portion of the code will be executed on quantum computer. And then again, those results will be back on classical computer. And then remaining process will be done on classical computer, whatever application required, right? So that is uh, kind of agreed across the globe that it, the quantum computer will work as an accelerator, like right now working on GPU, where in GPU also any application we write, it starts on CPU, part of the code get offload on GPU, then again, those results come back on CPU and then we get the post-processing and get the desired result. Similarly, in quantum case, uh, part of the code will get offload to the quantum uh, QPU, quantum processing unit. Now, the in view of these, the developer requirement is uh, first thing, time to solution, right? We all know the qubit of quantum computer. They are holding their state for limited time. So one thing is the time to offload the um, data from classical to quantum and take back the result that should be minimal. And second, whatever we are doing the total application code that has to be fast enough, right? Otherwise, why to use quantum? We could have done with the classical only, right? So to get the better performance, what are the hiccups? Those should not be there and developers should work on there uh, while developing the code. And second is it should be easily programmable. All the what language commonly use C++, Python. Uh, nowadays, those developments are going on. Those should be supported. Interoperable. Um, in classical system, we have many kind of parallelism now, like OpenMP, uh, which is for shared memory parallelism, then MPI for distributed memory parallelism, then GPU side offloading for NVIDIA, it's a CUDA enable, OpenACC, those kind of things. So all these should be supported, right? Interoperable in between, we would like to offload on quantum also. And these quantum offloading, there is a, uh, in 2020, Microsoft came up with the quantum intermediate representation, QIR, standards of QIR. So those should be followed. And generally those are followed using LLVM, which is module-based compiler tools, set of compilers are there, which enables um, um, compiler to translate the code into machine language. And it's a module-based approach. So uh, first it can be optimized in one step and second step, the executable is made according to the architecture. So generally preferences, it should be based on LLVM. The standards, what is set by Microsoft in 2020, how the things, uh, how the classical and quantum will talk to each other, those should be followed. And then all should be seamless, like easier. So um, to address that, NVIDIA came up with the three offerings on these, right? Uh, first is CUDA Quantum. CUDA Quantum is the framework which allows uh, the classical uh, uh, write the code now in the CUDA Quantum framework, which tomorrow any kind of QPU come and integrate with the classical system, it will be seamlessly run on that system also. On classical, it will exploit the GPU capabilities and on uh, actual QPU come, then it will get offload there because we have tie up with across uh, almost all the OEMs who are manufacturing the quantum processors and their software stacks, we are tie up, uh, we have tie up. So it will be seamlessly uh, run on those whenever the actual quantum computer will be available. The second key offering is Ku quantum. Uh, the Ku quantum is to accelerate your simulations on classical system. Nowadays, any simulation we do generally on classical, uh, Generally, we say we can go up to 10 to 14 qubit because on larger qubits, either the job hangs on classical system or it takes very long, right? So Ku quantum um, enables if the classical system is GPU enabled, hybrid system, there it makes the algorithms execution faster by utilizing GPU. Uh, second thing, it increases the number of qubits, one system can run approximately 35 to 36 state vector qubits. Of course, with there are other ways to run for higher qubits like TensorNet. There we can go even 1,000, 2,000 qubits. And uh, third one is uh, it's a one framework. Who quantum is the one framework, one container, one need to download and install. 
there one can get all the frameworks like circ whisket panelane so no need to bother about installation of those framework one by one how it will go uh, there could be dependent libraries mismatch the version and so on simply install the ku quantum container which is one or two steps and easier to use and in that one will get all the frameworks so whether those are running on gpu or not non gpu doesn't matter once the ku quantum install one can start running their code using circ and uh, quiskit circ panel in any framework right the last we are coming up with the hybrid integration um, that is we are tying tying up with the various uh, our partners and we are coming up with a system where the translation from or hello exchange between qpu and classical becomes easier um, very efficient and faster right so that qubit remain in their state and we can do fast processing so let's start uh, i will deep dive little bit about cuda quantum first and then ku quantum and then i will talk about one of the our system upcoming system where uh, with their features and what can be done there right so this hybrid uh, quantum classical computing it is uh, very much essential nowadays we know all vqe algorithm and other thing they run in hybrid mode and their part of it run on classical and then remaining run on uh, quantum right so for that this cuda quantum is being developed it is um, supports any kind of qpu um even it run on the uh, simulators also right now on classical that it runs um there is a compiler also part of this uh, cuda quantum so one that compiler nvq++ that can be used which right now if you want to run your code after developing in cuda quantum it will run on classical but tomorrow part if you would like to run on particular quantum computer that also it will run only compile time need to be changed no need to change in the code right then it is interoperable all kind of parallelism it supports uh, right now we are supporting the c++ and python programming languages which are most commonly used right um and bottom side if you see there is a we have given the link ngc container it's a free to download and uh, one should go there and read there are more details available there in ngc container right as i said nowadays we use on classical also various kind of Uh, parallelism to exploit the uh, performance from the available architecture uh, so cuda quantum support all kind of uh, these uh, standards uh, say cuda open mp open acc uh, standard parallelism all these kind of being supported in cuda quantum right and uh, as we know that immediate uh, domains um as everyone talk about these are the four domain drug discovery chemistry finance optimization there we will see the quantum advantage very soon um all these are being supported uh, significant research is being going on you might follow the recent announcement from supercomputing uh, there you will see nvidia and we are partnering with all the uh, user user agencies where the development work going on or research going on and you will see the significant research is coming out there right here is the list of cuda quantum partners and this is further updated day by day more agencies are partnering with us so you will see almost all the key player who are in the oem side of quantum computer they are partnering with us we are integrating cuda quantum in their ecosystem so that today one develop the program tomorrow no need to change the code right and how it works in cuda quantum um this is a uh, simple code where the above side if you see uh, we are doing some quantum operation like gates applying the gate generate poly permutations and so on so this part we know it should run on quantum system qpu so here we start defining cuda q and then uh, two columns right colon colon and then we define our operation function name and so on and then bottom side we are doing the lu factorization which we know it may run better on classical system or on gpu so we use a particular library which will run on gpu so bottom side we are using cuda q solver uh, that is that it will run on gpu 
Now, what compiler will do, we compile this code, NVQ++, uh, minus QPU. First stage, we are thinking it will run on simulators only. So we run only Q quantum. Uh, we define minus QPU equal to Q quantum means it will run on simulator where it will exploit the GPU capabilities, everything it will run there. And then we compile this code vqe.cpp. And then whatever results we are getting just shown here. The bottom side, what we see is we run the same code without any modification on uh, QPU. Here we are using Quantinum. And uh, simply we need to give the system name QPU equal to Quantinum uh, H1. And here the code, the part of the code is offloaded on uh, quantum system and remaining it run on classical. You will see that both results are slightly varying and that is because it run on actual quantum computer, the bottom side. The, but the message here is once you develop the code using CUDA quantum, which is free, easily installable, um, no need to bother about actual quantum computer and one can run uh, easily without seamlessly the code, right? Uh, this is the performance when we use the standard uh, Python Python framework versus CUDA quantum. With CUDA quantum, we see for 20 qubits, we get around 300 times the speed up, right? Now would like to discuss a little bit about Q quantum. CUDA quantum is, uh, I will keep it here and use case I will discuss in end. So Q quantum is, as I said, uh, there are many work which is going on as a simulator right now. Uh, those are like developing the algorithms, discover the use cases for quantum, quantum advantage, and even the validating the future hardware. So simulations are key. While running on classical computer, if we run only on CPU, sometimes it takes more time or it restricts in number of qubits. To address those, we came up with the Q quantum. It is also available in the container form. Um, and then it supports uh, multi-node, multi-GPU also, so we can scale. It will run on large data center and it simulate ideal or noisy qubits with the state vector and uh, tensor network. It supports both of them, right? And here you can, no need to, all these frameworks are integrated with QQuantum, no need to install them separately. CERC, Wiskit, Penilane, AWS, and Cubo, and so on. Every day we are increasing those frameworks in this QQuantum, right? So one need to just simply um, uh, as in a container form, uh, install the QQuantum and start working. No need to bother about any framework, whatever uh, developer is using. They can keep do, using that CERC or QSKIT or Penilane. Um, no need any other installation. Only QQuantum installation is enough, right? Uh, here I'm showing the multi-GPU performance. Um, if we run the same code, uh, like the Supremacy, Shore, QFT. These are well popular. I would say these are kernel, which is being used in many codes, uh, like QFT being used for HLL algorithm and so on. So here, what we did is we run them on CPU and here the relative performance is shown for each of the code. Uh, if CPU time is one, how much faster they are. So if you see on eight GPU, even we, we are going 370 times for Shore algorithm faster for QFT around 300 times faster, right? Um, here are the results which we run on the India system that is available on CDEC. Here we run the Shore, QFT, and CQMR, all three algorithms. What we are showing, if we run it on our earlier generation of GPUs, like V100, and running on new generation of GPU, A100, uh, in comparison to CPU, how the performance looks like. One thing to note, if you see the uh, all the simulations are performed for 30 qubit, 32 qubit on one node. So as I mentioned before, if you run on CPU on the system on one node, you may not able to run simulations for these many larger qubit because limitation of memory or it will take very long time, right? Uh, our latest um, uh, version of this, it supports the multi-node and which allows to run for larger qubits. Say single node, we are running for say 32, 34 qubits, but on um, with multiple node, we can go up to 50 qubit for a state vector. And for tensor net, we can even go for large number of qubits. Here we are showing the performance as we increase the number of node, 
the the execution times come down which we call it as a strong scaling in high performance computing domain so for a strong scaling we are seeing good performance as we increase the number of gpus right there is uh, another technique to because in day to day we know that um 50 qubits are not enough to solve the, our day to day problem so there is another technique called max cut which is based on tensornet uh, uh, this gives the approximate solution, not the exact solution like uh, a state vector, but it it requires the less memory because it keeps only current um, layers memory footprint more. And that's where we could run the higher qubits here. Uh, the results are shown here for up to 5,000 qubits. When we run up to 20 node, uh, we, we get around 93% accuracy versus a state vector. But then those are up to 5,000 or 10,000 qubits are possible to run using this method, right? And these are supported in Pooh Quantum. Uh, let's talk, uh, you might see that various use case nowadays, you know, various uh, research paper as well as various blogs where NVIDIA Pooh Quantum or CUDA Quantum being used. In Europe, all the agencies uh, which are uh, looking forward for quantum computer, they are working with us. Similarly, in US, many agencies are working. Even industry side, BMW, uh, they use this Ku quantum for pathfinding and as well as uh, the vehicle optimization in terms of like where to put the sensors in the vehicle, those kind of study. They use this uh, Ku quantum and get the better performance. Similarly, for carbon capturing for climate change, this is essential to capture the climate. And uh, to capture the climate, they are another variant, uh, another molecule, amine base molecule, which we we would like to detect. And that if that molecule is there, that can um, absorb the carbon dioxide, and that is easy to control, right? For that, the simulation, there are various permutation and combinations possible. And that's where the quantum come into picture. So that is being used for uh, in a, uh, for using VQ algorithm, right? Right now, the recently the nurse announced the their two hundred thousand nodes hours, uh, which are having the Pooh quantum and CUDA quantum there, right? Um, Brokerhaven Laboratory they are working in QML, particularly in the differential privacy domain, and they are leveraging this Ku quantum and CUDA quantum both to get the better solution in time and for larger qubits. Uh, similarly, the Volkswagen they are doing the for vehicle optimization and Airbus for the uh, to have the optimum flight trajectory. Uh, both are uh, related to the carbon emission as well. Right. So there are various use cases. I'm talking about limited use case, but you will see the more videos and uh, other things are available on that. Uh, one can look into that. Right. With that, uh, last but not least, I would like to talk about the one server. Uh, the configuration of one server, which is recently launched by NVIDIA. Uh, the beauty of this server is this has one GPU and one CPU. CPU is based on ARM. GPU is our next generation GPU, Hopper. Uh, that is with the HBM3 memory. Uh, the main key is connectivity between CPU and GPU. They are on a single chip. They are connecting with the 900 gigabyte per second speed, anvil link speed. So it is kind of seeing the memory each other. Anywhere if we see uh, CPU to CPU, generally they are connected with PCI and their bandwidth is around 50 or 60 gigabyte per second, right? But here we are giving the memory bandwidth is uh, CPU to GPU is 900 gigabyte per second bi-directional. So at a time minimum 450 uh, gigabyte per second, memory will be there per sec uh, one-sided, right? Now, so, and then this GPU is LD, uh, the GPU has the memory attached, which is LPDDR5, and that will be 512 GB. And again, that access to that memory is around 500 GB per second. So overall, this system, uh, this system with the memory available, it allows to simulate around 34 to 35 state vector qubits in one go uh, with single unit of this system. If we go on multi-node, then we can have more, um, uh, more uh, qubits, right? Um, just a little bit description of the CPU side. As I said, it is ARM-based CPU. It's a Neoverse V2. 
uh, it has 72 cores and it is 1.6 time more efficient than x86 cpu and 3.6 petaflop uh, floating point six, uh, 64 bit floating point operation 3.6 teraflops for that right memory bandwidth is now uh, memory bandwidth is very high uh, it is around 500 gigabyte per second that allows to uh, have faster memory access similarly for gpu we have hopper gpu which is 96 gigabyte memory and with this combination, one can run the 35, 34, 35 qubits simulation on one unit of this system. With that, I would like to close. Hope I did okay. not overshoot. Uh, okay, great. Uh, thanks, thanks, Manish, for the presentation. Uh, I can see that there is one question on the chat, but unfortunately, our next speaker, Anlam, uh, um, uh, Professor Amlan, uh, don't have time, um, and he will, he will need to. Uh, leave us just shortly after the talk. So let's go now to uh, his talk, so to the talk of Professor Amlan. Uh, and uh, Manish, uh, uh, if you can, you can uh, potentially try to answer uh, the question on the chat. So there sure, is a question. we'll do that. Yes. Yeah, Great, thank, thank you, you very much. And Thanks a lot. Yes, yeah. Professor Amlan, we apologize for a delay, but if you are ready, the Zoom is yours. Uh, yeah, I am, I am fine. I hope that I am audible to all of you. And yes, thanks, yes, I can um, hear. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Manish, for your excellent presentation. Uh, right, it's always good to see that uh, there's so much work has been done, uh, okay, by the pioneer like Nvidia, okay, for supporting the quantum simulations. Thanks, Manish. Okay, so so what I will speak today will be a bit on the okay on the more on the quantum uh, okay, quantum computing side, and and we will try to try to have an overview of what is this quantum machine learning. And obviously, quantum machine learning is obviously a domain which cannot be uh, okay covered anyway in the thirty minutes. But what I will try to try to do, I will try to just give the okay, give the basic notation that that means how it differs from classical machine learning, and what are the things we have to have in mind when we try to um, okay define a problem or try to plan a problem in the quantum machine learning. Okay, and that's my talk. Okay, so, so this is the agenda. I will just touch upon the basics, and then I will discuss with some of the uh, basics of the quantum machine learning, some use cases, and the challenges. So so we know that what we do in the quantum, we are actually trying to okay trying to use the the atomic and subatomic states of matter for okay for quantum computing and and it is uh, again a paradigm shift okay we had a lot of paradigm uh, shift in computing architectures right and and from the from the mechanical from the okay the electromechanical architectures to the silicon era and now we are going to a paradigm uh, shift of okay the atomic atomic and subatomic computing and that's that's what is quantum computing now, you know, obviously, quantum computing essentially means the systems which are okay physically can handle atomic states, okay, which can which can transform atomic states, right? Which are the quantum gates or quantum operations, and we can and we can get a useful computation out of it. Uh, there are there are phenomena like entanglement and superposition, which makes the uh, which makes the quantum computing very different, okay, from what we have in the classical computing domain, right, okay. And now let us start the very basics. So. So computing means that we are trying to okay trying to transform or we are trying to okay okay update the memory states right and in a and in a quantum quantum system what is a memory state so a memory state is something a state of a quantum okay a quantum system is defined by a state psi and this is a single qubit state because I have shown in this uh, I have shown a one loss sphere so so the so this defines a quantum state which is a state psi right and then and then we have the different measurement basis, right? The first one of the measurement basis is the is the is the basis of the z basis, which we say as the as the zero as the up, and and one as the down, and another one is the x basis, which is the which is, which are again the two orthogonal orthogonal states, okay, zero plus one and zero minus one with two. Now, you know, this is very important. Why I'm telling this? Uh, this we have to understand when we do quantum machine learning because everything is a state vector, right? We can we have to we have to look into the quantum state and we have to just try to see how we can encode the encode the data in the in the future space, right? Using the quantum state vector, right? And how we can how we can go to the measurement on the basis so that we can come up come up with an outcome or with an inference in the quantum in the quantum machine learning model. Right, and that is the entire entire game of quantum machine learning. So to understand this is very important. And now, now obviously, when we look into this, we have some states which are which are 
bipartite and some states which are non bipartite. For example, I have shown you two examples, right? right. This one, the top one is the, is something where we can decompose this particular quantum state into two, into two, uh, two disjoint quantum states, okay? Which are, which can be again coupled to a tensor product. But, but, but if we try to, right, if we are to look in this particular state, right, we cannot make it two disjoint qubit states, right? These are the, this is a two qubit state, Okay, which uh, which cannot be disjoint, cannot be cannot be defined or cannot be decomposed into you know two disjoint qubit states, and that's that's entanglement, and this is also very important when we try to look into the quantum computer, quantum machine learning. We'll come to this very soon, and the and the way we can do these entangled states are there are very specific ways uh, of doing the entangled states, and this can extend up to multiple qubits. So we show here for two qubit entangled states, which are commonly called as Bell states, but this can be uh, okay, this can be extended to multiple quantum uh, states, and this can be used for quantum algorithms very efficiently. And this is very, 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 very well used in the quantum teleportation type of okay or quantum communication also. Now, now let's come into that. That means how how we try to how we try to visualize the quantum circuit as a as a sort of in the in the training paradigm, right? When we say machine learning, means that we start from a particular particular baseline model and then we try to try to update the model to okay to our training and the model absorbs the okay absorbs the domain knowledge right to the learning and then the then that model actually works fine for the new new data so so what we need to think in terms of the quantum machine learning is that this quantum transformation so what we do starting okay so if you look into this diagram it states that hey you have a have the have the have the quantum states which we start with some some quantum states spin up and spin down right whatever form of spin so each of the spin defines a particular qubit state right and then we have a have a series of transformations some transformations are very uh, okay very thumb rule transformations like Hadamard transformations right which just generate the superposition so so we can generate a large amount of qubit states with a, 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 a so we can generate generate ideally we can generate a two to the power n state space with n qubits, right? If you right if all the qubits are superposition uh, superposed qubits, and that is what Hadamard gate does. But after Hadamard gate, what we need to do? We need to do a lot of transformations, and these transformations, if you look into the vector, right? We right what we uh, shown earlier. If you go to the vector, so this transformation means we are just changing the vector right changing the vector in different uh, different orientations right and these orientations once we change a vector right and we change the orientation the same vector will have a different value on this on this measurement axis right and that is and that is what is the quantum what we obtain from a quantum state right what we obtain from a quantum state is something what we okay what we actually okay measure the quantum state on a particular basis Right, and we and we get the value. So, so this is very important that that how we modulate the quantum state with the transformations across the different uh, different axes, right, of the of the state space, right, and ultimately we do the measurement, right, to converge to a certain, okay, to a certain definite result, okay, through measurement. Right, that's the entire 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 quantum quantum circuit story. Now. Now, if we just if we just if we don't look into the don't look into the quantum gate structure, right? If you consider this the black box, right? And and if you only look into the data part of the quantum system, right? How how we can visualize that? So what we can what we can look into a quantum system is something like which is here, right? And 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 where we start, we can start with an equal superposition of all the states, and that's very well well done. Right with that, as I said, that when I when I take all the all the all the qubits initialized to zero and apply an Hadamard, right, we can generate a two to the power n state space, right, and in that state space, all the, the all the uh, states are equiprobable, right, because it is an Hadamard superposition. But what we do in these transformations, in the transformations, we actually try to modulate the distribution. So we start with a very uniform distribution. Right, and this and this sequence of quantum gates, right, actually generates modulates the distribution, and the distribution becomes skewed, right, skewed, which means the probability of some states, some some states are preferred than other states, right, and this and these states, these states will have a higher probability when we try to measure the quantum system, 
right? And these states will be our most probable the states where the result we can obtain the we can actually uh, okay compute the result of the quantum system. So so if we are trying to if we are trying to evaluate something from a quantum system through our algorithm, right? What we have to do we have to try to see the sequence of gate operations and the measurement operations are all very very well mapped. Okay, so that we can get the get the outcome and we can maximize the outcome okay and and these type of algorithms are generally called quantum quantum algorithms and this and a class of algorithms are called quantum optimization algorithms also okay like we have the quantum approximate optimization algorithms and these algorithms extends the computational complexity space a bit so 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 we extend the p class of problem which are the okay sorry the, the we, we extend the p class of problem and we and we and we have some of the NP class of problems comes into the P class of problem, but not it's uh, it's not a straight P, right? As a classical computing, we study the BQP. It's a bounded error quantum polynomial problems. Okay, so which means that some class some class of the problems which are uh, which are NP problems, which are essentially uh, essentially non-deterministic problems, right? Uh, okay, they can be polynomial. Uh, uh, we can achieve a polynomial solution if we if we if we try to okay try to to do the quantum 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 formulation if we can do the quantum formulation and we can generate a quantum solution for that so that that is the quantum supremacy what we can tell but if we look into the domain of machine learning so from the quantum algorithm if we just uh, so so quantum machine learning obviously stands on the quantum algorithm right the basic postures of quantum algorithm are taken and they are and they are just being expanded to to to, to the feature space encoding Right and trying to and trying to generate a sort of quantum quantum machine learning model, right? So let's look into this. What happens? So so quantum machine learning obviously okay has a lot of promises, right? People say there is a hype. So a lot of all these all these big players, okay okay like IBM, like Google, like uh, okay, like Intel, okay like Nvidia, right? They are doing tremendous work in all of these domains, and they are. Right, and they are constantly upgrading, upgrading either the physical systems or the or the simulations and the uh, right and the platforms, right, so that we can uh, we can uh, we can actually get out or we can actually look into the uh, leverage leverage this for for solving the quantum uh, complex problems, and we can and we can obviously um, okay try to find out some good good means of applying the quantum machine learning. So. So what we need to understand in the case of the of the learning is that the learning means okay some okay when we try to tell that a machine or okay a particular model in machine learning the the model works with hyperparameters right and these hyperparameters are actually your tweaking factors of the models right and if the model has learned well the hyperparameters are well adjusted right so that we can okay so that we can actually generate the inference with a very low error. And similarly, it happens in the case of quantum okay, quantum circuits also, right, or quantum models also. So in the terms of quantum models, we say that it's called a parameterized quantum circuit. So, so every, every quantum operation is a unitary transform. That's why they are represented as U, right? And why they're represented as theta? Because these transforms, due to the limitation of time, I cannot get into the details of the mathematical part of it, but, but these unitary transforms, all the, all the coefficients of the matrices are 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 essentially complex, right? They can be represented by 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 x plus i y. So if we can represent any coefficient with x plus i y, I can always have a okay have a way to represent it as okay okay as an amplitude and a phase part. Okay, because any complex number can be represented as a amplitude in the phase part. So, so essentially, essentially, a particular unitary unitary matrix, which is for okay for quantum computation, right, will have a will have a phase part. So that's where we parameterize these quantum gates as something u theta. Okay, there's an amplitude part and there is a phase part or there's an angle part. Okay, so the angular angular part in the terms of the particular uh, okay, basis of measurement. Okay, so now if we look into this, so so how we try to okay try to look into this particular problem of this and and this is a phenomenal paper written by Edward Furry where where he has shown into uh, okay that is how we can do the classification is okay yeah, using quantum neural network. 
So what it tells is that, hey, we have a certain state of, okay, we represent a particular uh, feature space okay, by qubit, right? And we try to, and we try to, okay, if, that if it is a training, if, if a supervised uh, learning problem, right? Then what we try to do, we need to adjust this, adjust this thetas of the, of this, of this particular, of the particular the gates, right? Of the, of the, of the transforms, which, which takes the, okay, takes the values mapped into the feature space, to a particular measurement outcome, right? And and this measurement outcome will essentially will be a level, right? If it is a supervised learning problem or okay, a, a, a classification problem, so so the entire 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 set of thetas will be tried to be adjusted in such a way so that given a particular set of features feature values, given a set of feature values, right? This circuit and encoded in the quantum in terms of qubits. Right, these gates are sufficient. This gate operations are sufficiently converged to a measurement, right, which will generate a particular level. And if we can, if we can do this for all the all the entire entire training set very efficiently, right, and we have adjusted all the thetas, we have got a particular quantum circuit, right, which can which can represent, uh, okay, which can actually um, which can actually work as a classifier. You know, what's the gain here? The gain here is that you can represent a large feature space using a very less amount of, uh, okay, okay, a qubit resource. And, and, and you can explore the feature space at one shot because all these, all these quantum operations are done in the same time, right? You don't need to, that means you can do a massive, a massive parallelism in the, in the, in the quantum state space, right? The power of them. And that is the quantum supremacy. So now if we look into, the actual scenario, right? This is a this is a scenario which is very very tough because you have to have large number of qubits. You have to have lot of lot of gate operations between the qubits, right? But but if we if we look into the real scenario, real scenario is that presently we have the NISQ SQ quantum processors, which means that noisy intermediate state quantum computing, which means that here we don't have so large number of qubits so that we can encode such a large number of 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 state and also also, the gets cannot work on so many qubits. So we have only a few qubits, right? And and obviously, when we go into the few qubits, uh, qubits, then we have to operate only on the few qubits, and the uh, and the and the constraint like nearest neighbor and connectivity of the qubits are very important. Okay, so these are the constraints which are there in the present technology, and we have to when we try to implement implement this quantum machine learning type of uh, okay, quantum machine learning algorithms in the present technology. Obviously, we have to. We have to make certain adjustments in the algorithm or certain certain steps, okay, so that we can actually cater the requirement. What the constraints? What are there in the NISQ? Okay. So, so this these quantum operations are basically this is a this is a sample classifier where we can see that these are the qubits and these are some of the single qubit operations, right, which are actually the rotation operations. Rotation oper rotation operations can be either on the X, Y, or Z, whatever axis are there, you can do rotation operations. And this, this is basically used for encoding the, from the qubit, you try it, to encode it to a feature space. And then we try to, okay, try to use certain operations so that the feature space, from the feature space, we can generate a sort of measurement, uh, okay, measurement which can generate the class boundary, right? Because ultimately, if you see the machine learning is the thing that once you create a feature space, you have to generate, a, if you are doing a classifier, you are generating a class boundary so that whatever you measure on the on the right on one part of the class boundary it is class zero and whatever you measure in the other part of the other half of the class boundary right it is one and you can tell it's a binary classifier i have made which is a zero one is zero level and one is level one so similarly what we need to do we need to actually take the entire feature space and we try to and we try to Okay, try to partition the partition the feature space into two maybe measurement measurement outcomes okay Okay, for some of the values in the feature space, your measurement outcome is zero, and for uh, that means uh, okay, okay, zero, and, and for and for some some values in the in the feature space, your measurement outcome is one, right? And then and then your classifier is done. So 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 that's the that's the role of this qubit, so that it can actually uh, okay this gate operation, so that you can actually uh, okay, come to the measurements. Okay, so now let us look into that. Uh, look into the thing that how this how this quantum state what what we described in the in the in the earlier slide in terms of in terms of the quantum uh, uh, state represented by psi right how we can generate the different uh, 
different encoded outcome of the of of the of the vector. So so if you look into here that these all are vectors, these all are individual vectors, right? And this can this can this can represent this can this can represent the different values in the feature space, right? And these values in the feature space are being generated by different values of the of the angle phi, right? Which is which is across the z axis. Right, you generate the different angle angles value of the angular value of the phi, and and this and this gets are possible. This this Rx rotations are possible. Okay, so so you actually rotate across across this particular uh, direction, and 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 the value of the phi, right, will actually the rotation will define a particular vector, and this vector will encode a particular uh, uh, a particular feature value in your space. Okay. Right, and similarly, you can do it in the in the other 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 axis, which is the y axis. Right, you can right, you can now you can do across the y axis, which gives you now another 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 more further, okay, okay, more further spread up of the values, right across. So so what I want to say here is that by using these rotation gets, if you if you look into the quantum machine learning encoding. Encoding in the fee, encoding and generating the quantum feature space, right, is basically basically this set of gates which can which can actually map to a particular value in the real classical feature space and that classical feature space value. Suppose you have a distribution in the classical feature space, right? How we can generate the same distribution, right, in the quantum feature space? Okay, these are the tricks, right? These are very generalized tricks, but but but, but these are the tricks by which you can do it. Okay, and 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 obviously that means one. Then I come again to a very 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 uh, sort of abstraction of this. So so how you can how we can optimize this particular theta parameters? But we are using the rotational parameters. Okay, okay for for our gets this for this we can use the classical optimizers. So a lot of lot of lot of algorithms you will see in the quantum machine learning that uh, okay that they, they try to measure and find the error and. Uh, and 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 okay, either a gradient descent or some optimization. They used to actually to adjust the theta of the gets and try to try to reduce the error and and try to uh, okay, try to define the loss function in a similar way. So the similar thing can be done okay for the okay for this particular circuits okay, and and uh, right in the other way other way what we try to do is that it's called the ANSAS right suppose. Suppose we have a particular a particular R a theta operation, R rotation operation is to be done. You can decompose into a variable form, right? You can decompose a particular okay, a particular operation into uh into a sequence of okay, sequence of these transformations, right? Each of this, each of this u theta can be decomposed. Suppose you have a u theta and you found the u theta, the problem is that though u theta is logical, right? What is physical in the technology? In the in the physical, in the technology, maybe maybe only single qubit and two qubit gets. So you need to have a decomposition of the of the logical u theta into the into the quantum operators. What you have in the technology, right? And that and there, right? And that is the how we develop the quantum circuits. Though there are some errors which uh, which automatically gets uh, gets into it because this is a matrix decomposition problem. You may not have an exact solution, but 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 still you can have a sort of very very a very near or very approximate solution of this particular problems okay right and 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 not getting into this there are a lot of applications in quantum machine learning we have found out uh, we are now working with some of the uh, okay some of the industries where we are trying to um, okay trying to look into the problem areas finance is one problem finance is a good domain uh, there are material science uh, okay exploring the materials and trying to uh, trying to understand the molecular structures both in terms of material science, both in terms of drug discovery, right? There are a lot of problems where we can actually use this, okay, use the optimization, okay, problems for 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 portfolio management, for uh, for 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 traffic traffic uh, traffic analysis. A lot of a uh, lot of things can be a lot of uh, okay problem areas are there where we can use this quantum machine learning very effectively, right? Right. I'm not getting into this. Quantum machine learning, uh, okay, presently is mostly classical data and quantum machine. But 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 once we go into the into the applications like quantum sensing and quantum meteorology, right? We will be into something called quantum data and quantum machines, right? And that will be very interesting problems because those are the areas where you have to apply quantum machines, right? You cannot work in the classical domain, okay? So 
so those are the those are the areas where we are really now getting into uh, right obviously classical data quantum machine okay quantum algorithm is one of the very good take uh, but i think the next takes are uh, the next future takes are coming in the in the domain of the okay of the quantum data right and quantum and quantum machine itself okay and uh, what i discussed uh, okay in the in the in the in the primary part uh, this is the this is the entire game so in the in the classical also you you make a kernel trick so kernel trick is something that you have you try to you try to define a define a nonlinear feature space and try to do a kernel transform so that in that transform domain your feature space becomes linear right and then you can have a you can have a good way to actually generate a class boundary okay so so we do from x to phi x in the in the domain of classicals and now what do we do in quantum is that the x to the mapping to the hill part space right which is called a phi x quantum state or phi x kit right and once we come to the phi x kit now we can do some transformations right and then we can go to the actual to the measurement right and this measurement converges to the okay to the to the class the class labels all measurement converts to the prediction values what you, whatever type of application we are trying to do right and this and this measurement is called an expectation value expectation value is basically basically that means a particular state right if we try to if we try to measure a particular state how much how much is the the probability of the particular state and this this is equivalent to a loss function right so when we try to when we try to define a loss function in the classical we generate okay we generate the okay the error the the error between the the the, the ideal and the and the generated value and we try to do something like rmsc and msc type of estimations when we do in the quantum it is actually right it is actually the in the expectation value of a particular state, right, which we try to, which we try to convert the system, right. If the expectation value is low, obviously we have to again go to uh, give a feedback to the system. Either we go in a classical way, right, or we can have some quantum mechanical way to adjust the adjust the uh, the the theta part of the okay of the particular vector of the quantum state vector and try to uh, try to enhance the enhance the enhance the expectation of the value of the of the of the states which are which are favorable right and try to and try to reduce the expectation value of the states which are unfavorable right this is also the game in quantum algorithms but we just try to try to do this in terms of the okay of the class levels in the case of the quantum machine learning right i will not get into much more now and these are the these are the same thing as I said that you have a sort of cost function and we try to update the values of theta. You define a cost function and you can take classical approach to adjust this theta. Okay, right. And just to uh, skip all these things, based on all these things, right, we have the equivalent architectures. Right, a neural network. You have equivalent architectures in the in the terms of the of the quantum computing also. Okay, and 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 also we have an equivalent CNN. So in the in the case of CNN, we have the layers like you have the feature layer, you have the convolution layer, right? Then you have a pooling and activation function. So so pooling is a sort of a selection, right? An activation function is a sort of actually switching, right? So this these things can be very very uh, very efficiently done by the Okay, by the quantum selection operations, which are basically okay, basically the control gets right. Control gets are are actually uh, find the values that mean the control control qubits control the control the outcome. So using the using the control qubits right and the activation function here is the measurement. So 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 we can use this control gets operation and activation functions uh, right, and we can actually in a in a in a similar way we can generate this. Uh, they generate the convolution neural networks, and there are good references available, which uh, which uh, which speaks about them. Okay, so I end by this quantum okay quantum machine learning um okay the models uh, though the time is very limited it requires a lot of uh, some understanding but but I think I have just tried to touch the okay touch the very the very basic way of the thought process right and if you look into the quantum machine learning use cases a lot of applications have come up from the fundamental machine learning to the quantum uh, deep learning understanding the feature space. Okay, the, the 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 okay, yeah. Addressing the nonlinearity is very well done in the case of of quantum machine learning. High dimensional data is very well done in case of quantum machine learning, and those are obviously obviously the 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 the, the okay the uh, the wishes or the or the 
but the push that why we should uh, why we should look into quantum machine learning as the as the as a probable um, okay probable uh, way out or probable way of actually solving okay solving them from the hard machine learning problems okay uh, there are challenges obviously there are a lot of challenges obviously quantum as i said that we are still in the nisq the in the quantum but, but there are promises of all the quantum quantum hardware vendors they will be scaling up the number of qubits within uh, within the next next few years obviously we have at least at least at least uh, 3 to 5x uh, 5x expansion of the number of qubits what we can have right obviously the hybrid quantum classical approaches are there we will need to settle down in a particular quantum algorithm Right, how we how we split the quantum and classical part, and how we have a very good interface between the quantum and classical part, and that is very it is it is it will be similar to the parallel uh, parallel computing approach that we have a particular a particular thread which is classical, and then uh, that was I think Manish also said this. Uh, okay, we will have a classical thread, and then we will look into the quantum Q, the QPU, okay, quantum processing unit, okay, for the quantum thread, and then we will try to uh, okay try to integrate or try to have a very seamless handshaking. Quantum data encoding. I have shown a little bit of this that how we can generate our data, uh, okay, and map it to our feature space using a quantum vector. Right, you have to have a very efficient technique of doing this, okay, for a large dimension of data, okay, keeping the keeping the feature space, okay, feature space in the in the in the in the in the same way, right? And obviously, that means as quantum system will be a demon, right? It will be a demon in the sense that if you that means it it can do a lot of things, lot of, uh, lot of data crunching. Right, obviously, ethical and security in the quantum domain, right, will be something which we need to look into, uh, which we need to look into as 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 a as a as a very immediate immediate thing. We have to plan that that once the quantum machine learning uh, systems or quantum system comes up, how to prevent the security, uh, that how to have the data security of the quantum systems itself itself will come up as a as a as a good problem to solve. Okay, uh, so. Uh, so just like end here, that means I have a, that we have a group uh, of quantum okay, quantum computing researchers. Most of them are now in industries. They are they have all graduated. A couple of them are still to graduate, right? And we work on various domains of quantum. We started from quantum CAD, but now we are very heavily into algorithms, uh, machine learning, and cryptography. We have a lot of collaborations, a lot of industries, uh, right? And we try to try to work closely with them. Right and also international universities. Uh, so, so obviously in conclusion, I want to say that nothing much, but 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 a lot of challenges are there. I've already highlighted and and obviously that is okay in the handling of high-dimensional data. Okay, the quantum encoding in the in the okay the quantum encoding and developing developing the models which are okay which 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 doesn't comes uh, comes from the inference of error, right? Because quantum Quantum error is very predominant in the NISQ era, so uh, so we need to okay need to look into look into the quantum in a very holistic way. It's, it, right, it's not that we have to just push a quantum algorithm because it shows very good in a in you know in the paper and pen, right? Right, it has to be it has to be well simulated. It has to be taken all the considerations, all the all the constraints into consideration, both the problem constraints as well as the technology constraints, right? And then we have to find that whether we can really solve the problem in the quantum domain, okay? Right, and these are the very good references of quantum machine learning. These are the very well cited papers uh, of the quantum machine learning, and and that each one of has actually opened a particular uh, direction in the quantum machine learning. Okay, right, and these are some of the works what we, uh, what our group, are not only not only quantum machine learning, but in the quantum EDA as a whole, quantum algorithms as a whole, right, over a few, over the few years. Right and and sorry that means I have a very hard cut off uh, okay so I have to rush a bit uh, but but if there is any question I can take one question and, and okay. I end my question. Thank yeah. you thank you very much Professor yeah, Aman yeah, yeah. we understand that you are in rush there's just one question yeah. on the chat so let me read it uh, sure so actually there is another one but I'm not sure if we'll match what parameters do you usually consider in your work when comparing quantum machine learning models with classical models. How do you convince people that quantum models are better than classical models? Okay, yeah, let me let, uh, let me answer. That. Yeah, so so uh, so if you like to look into the parameters in the in the quantum models, the parameters in the quantum models are nothing but the parameterized quantum circuit. Okay, so so as I said, that you have to take the quantum encoded feature space right to the measurement, right, and the transformation will be done. 
Okay, to a sequence of quantum operations. Now, you know, this this parametric space in quantum domain is is a pretty complex because it is a it is a vector which which has both amplitude and and uh, and, uh, and 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 an angle, right? And you can do it across multiple axes. As I saw, uh, as I as I shown, there are two axes, R X and R Y. So, so in the sense, optimizing the quantum circuit, right, might might be uh, might be a complex problem, right? But but provided you have a that means you have a quantum circuit, right? What you can do, what you can do in the test scenario, right? You can you can actually apply it over a large data space, right? Because because uh, because you can you can uh, that means the, the okay the feature space that the, the encoding of the feature space is n to the power n, so so you can size of two to the power n. Right, and that and that saves the saves the cost of computing, and that saves the cost of resource. So that is the if you can if you can optimize the u theta within a within a particular uh, uh, okay some some steps, right? You can efficiently solve the problem much faster, right, than a classical computer, right? And that's the that's the key, right? But 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 how? How challenge is to is to get the exact u theta, okay? The problems for which we can generate the u theta in a simple way obviously has a quantum supremacy. But people are trying to okay, trying to work on this u theta in a better way, and and hopefully the quantum research will come in that direction where we can have a sort of okay gain right in terms of these quantum parameters okay compared to the classical ones. Yes. Okay. Uh, we have one more question, but I'm not sure if you have time to answer. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah I, can, I can go. Like this, okay, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. there's a question about classical SVMs. Yeah, so, yes, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let's go on. Yeah, mm -hmm. so classical classical SVM represents the decision uh, trees because, yeah, because decision, but, 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 but we have to see that the, okay, the decision, decision trees are, are really complex in that sense also. Right, because 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 for a large feature space, right, decision trees, handling decision trees, it might be a very complex job. Okay. Uh, similarly, SVM is also a challenging if you have a large feature space because you have this uh, the, the 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 okay the feature space becomes a more 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 larger. Your optimization uh, uh, parameters are more uh, are more there. So so quantum SVM in a sense, right, in a sense. Quantum SVM, in a sense, can be better because it can handle the larger feature space and analyze the larger feature space faster. Okay, 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 faster than 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 that of the classical, right? And there you can leverage the quantum, okay, okay, the quantum SVM, right? You can you can right you can analyze the larger larger feature space in a in a in a small small number of steps than you need to do in the classical. So, so that leveraging is there in the case of quantum SVM, and and obviously the tree, right? Tree and SVM are both are a 50-50, right? When we have a larger feature size, right? But 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 quantum SVM uh, feature space, but 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 quantum SVM can handle larger feature space compared to classical. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks for once again for a great presentation. Thanks for answering all the questions. And uh, now Thank it's you. time for our last uh, speaker, last but not least, uh, Iraiz Montalban. Uh, so Iraiz, if you are ready, the Zoom is yours and we can start. And we apologize uh, for a delay. Yeah, no worries. I will be sharing my screen. So let me know if you can hear me and see the screen. Yes, <laughs> yes I can hear you. I can see your screen. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So thanks, thanks to everyone for for attending this last talk, and thanks everyone that speak before because it gives me a, a really well prepared floor to 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 tackle the what we are gonna cover uh, in this in this few minutes. So basically, I will I will focus in in challenges uh, for industry around quantum computing, or some of the challenges we have found were taking quantum computing to to industry players. So um, some of you may may ask or may wonder why. Uh, industry relevant i think this this point was also mentioned before but um the hype doesn't always help in uh, when adopting a, a technology and it 
kind of sometimes gives this uh, emotional roller coaster of making a huge uh, or having huge expectations over over a given technology, and then this disappointment that it doesn't uh, it doesn't provide right. And this has uh, we can learn from 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 the past from from AI where we had this 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 emotional roller coaster indeed and. It's not so much the emotional part of it, but it it also harms the investment and the support you get in a in a given field. Even though there is always a stubborn people still working on it and doing progress, and we think or I think that it's more beneficial if we have if we have this steady pace where you can basically uh, bring uh, novelty to the industry in an applied manner, bring some usefulness, and that somehow creates this flywheel where this helps uh, to boost uh, academia research and 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 somehow improves the, the field in, in, a, in a more general manner than for specific individuals or, or, or specific fields so uh, one of the main challenges we often find when when we're talking to 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 customers is that uh, essentially quantum machine learning doesn't mean uh, same thing for for all of them and it's kind of fair let's say because Machine learning is pretty clear uh, for them. Machine learning basically involves data, involves classical resources, and you use those classical resources to infer from this data patterns, decisions to be made, the ideas that they support your business processes. But when you introduce the, the word quantum to it, it seems like it gets really fuzzy because depending on the industry, and we are talking a little bit about a general, let's say, view of, of industry, not not a specific industry like could be chemistry where where it, it could take a, a a different drift let's say from 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 the from from the vast majority of what they do with with machine learning and quantum machine learning. but in general this involves that uh, we need to use in classical data and we need to use classical resources and quantum resources to bring this this these decisions to our to our uh, to 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 do a better performance, to a uh, more accurate results, to things that will improve the the existing business processes, and and this is what they are they are looking for. So they are looking for for a way in which quantum uh, quantum formalism and quantum hardware will 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 bring this 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 capacity or will bring this this boost, let's say, from from what they already have, and it's uh, it's good to to let them know that even though. Um, we have gone a, a long way with quantum hardware. It's still in, in 25 years, we went from two qubit uh, algorithms uh, to, to basically having uh, 1,000 qubits available through the cloud remotely. So it's it's quite a milestone that we have achieved in 20, 25 years, but still these are not uh, as reliable as, as classical machines. When, when when we talk about classical machines, we don't care about the voltages or we don't care so much about the low level uh, mechanics of, of these machines. But with quantum computers, we still need to be aware of, of, of what they do in order to, to make our problems fit into this specific hardware in this specific setup. And even the, the the name, the quantum device could could mean different things. We do have uh, quantum annealers that have been around for a while that help us uh, solve combinatorial optimization problems. We do have analog uh, hardware like neutral atom platforms where maximum independence set type of problems fit naturally into this. So we can always look for use cases that, that pair nicely with these hardware. But uh, most of the times when we talk to, to, to customers, when we when we talk about quantum hardware, we talk about digital gate gate based quantum computers, which is a really uh, a really good idea. But sometimes uh, they give the impression that you can abstract from the hardware, which is not often the case. Um, when when you do your algorithms and you 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 uh, design your circuits. At some point, you need to care out how it's gonna end on the, on the hardware, and depending on the hardware you choose, uh, if you look at the IBM Brisbane uh, section that I'm highlighting here, or you look at the INQ Harmony, there are some some issues you will face on the connectivity of the qubits, the the velocity at which at which they can uh, put operations, or the the different aspects of the of the hardware itself that would make your algorithm perform in a different way. And you need to adapt your algorithm to this. So the final version of your algorithm too will be an adaptation to those hardware. And, and we need to be really aware of this. That that's why we focus a lot in creating 
short the, the, the circuits because um, the noise will affect as we increase the size of these of, of these uh, algorithms. We need to be really aware if swap strategies need to be need to be um, included because of the topology is not all too well connected, like in the IBQ case. But we need to go beyond twenty qubits that IBM could allow us to do. So these are the type of things we we need to care about when we fully, let's say, design the the, the algorithm. And more in particular, when you we do these variational approaches, this quantum machine learning, where we we run a circuit, we learn, we we obtain some results from this circuit and we by 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 what we have obtained we optimize tweak this circuit so variationally training towards a, a given goal and this complex uh, uh, interaction between uh, classical and quantum computers makes us uh, need to include error mitigation and error suppression uh, steps in all in all the steps that, that the algorithm will take. So you need to be really aware uh, still of what is going on at the hardware level, and that's some uh, that's a challenging uh, task that we you need to uh, explain and educate most of the industry on this because there is this. Uh, this understanding that the abstraction level could be at the same level as classical um, counterparts. It's not that it's not there yet, I would say. So um, if if we think of, of some examples of this um, journey, uh, I think uh, quantum annealing uh, is a is a really good example because it's we, you basically you can pose this evolution uh, of an initial uh, state that is taken to the ground state of a target Hamiltonian. And basically we have machines that, that can make, encode this. So if you are if you can provide a, a target Hamiltonian, then all this uh, evolution can be encoded into the hardware in efficient way or the most efficient way they, they can do. But if you want to um, tackle other type of problems that are I see in old Cubo type of models, then you need to um, come with different versions. You need to Come with adaptations that only gate-based um, uh, computers will, will allow you to be uh, as flexible as, as, as you want, let's say. And it's a good thing because you can always define different target uh, Hamiltonians or different scheduling functions and do this, perform this evolution yourself. So you design this evolution. But uh, it could be that you need to, to have like a large uh, a large algorithm in order to to perform the same type of evolution as you would do in a in a efficiently uh, designed uh, quantum annealer. So one one jump that that actually made a, a made a quality a step forward is the the addition of of classically optimized um, values, so scheduling values or, or parameters in this case, like that is the basically the QAOA, the representation of QAOA, taking these blocks and placing them in those places where you will get the most um, compact version of this of this evolution, right? And some of the works we have done are uh, expand further this 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 fact. Like you can basically take QAOA, and you can uh, from this evolution uh, include uh, counter derivative protocols and do this parameter uh, tuning at the end. And what you end up is with a five-fold um, uh, shallower version of that same circuit mapping the same uh, state distribution. And this is uh, this is really good because if you can compress further your algorithm, the less error you will accumulate when, when you go to, to hardware. This is um, this is part of the work we have done in this uh, collaboration work that I'm highlighting below, efficient DC algorithm for portfolio optimization. And the main challenge here is that um, we, when going to hardware, and this was using IM, IMQ's ARIA machine, uh, the, the maximum number of assets we were able to optimize is 20 assets, which doesn't sound so industry scale. So we need to really understand what uh, our industry uh, players or the people we will be talking to, what they mean by actually solving a, a use case, a, a problem that is um, that reflects their business processes. Because if if you do a simple exercise in, in for example, for this manufacturing of, of parts of made out of steel sheet, if you do the calculations, you will see that even for simplistic cases, like taking two metal sheets that need to be split into four parts each, cutting them in a given machine and then bending them in a different machine. So you need to schedule where when a part goes to a, to a different machine in three different um time steps that it would be the first line you see there in the in the table you can see that we already come up with a with a higher order unconstrained quadratic optimization type of problem that, that requires 44 variables 44 qubits that are 
are available in some in some hardware providers, but not in all of them. And this is the most simplistic version of, of, of the of the problem you could see. And and if you just scale it up and start adding parts and still sheets, you can see that it it, it increases a lot the, the amount of resources we will need from a quantum device. And more in, in fact, if you take it to the cubal version of it, if if you restrict yourself to quadratic relationship between the between the variables, then you go easily into the thousands regime, which is it's challenging from the hardware side that you you can basically take this to 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 a, to a device. So we need to really select the cases that will benefit from the hardware at, at the status it is, but also bring some 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 performance, some improvement to the to the to the industry. So um, the good thing is that there is hope, and and I wanted to highlight some of the of the of the. Uh, things we learn, but while doing this this type of approaches with 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 key industry players, and probably one that has basically touched every every industry is uh, they all have data and they all have data sets. And doing a, a sensible selection of these of these features is, is is of relevance to to for most of them. So why is important this this activity of feature selection? So uh, first of all. In, in specific industries like the health industry, each feature it's actually what you are using to 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 perform an inference of, a, of an illness over a cohort, and um, could be really invasive test, could be really expensive to take. So if we can uh, justify that by removing this feature, you lose no information or, or no relevant information, then there is a good um that's a, that's a good thing that you can do basically and and finding ways in which you can systematize this uh, mechanism it's it's really important for them so it helps us improve the the data acquisition at at, at the process level at, at the, the cost of for for it in many cases it also helps to generalize to create models that are less biased and can, can generalize better and in general, it reduces the data size because if you can remove noise from the from the data, it's always uh, it's always good. Let's say it's always a, a good thing to do, and and it it helps a lot boost the the whole data science and machine learning process for for many companies. So if you take these examples that uh, that I basically took from from towards data science, and you test this would be the the outcome of the full uh, of the full data set, giving an accuracy of ninety percent more or less, and you do the recursive feature elimination. Compared to quantum feature elimination, you can see that there is already some kind of benefit there because uh, not only you can you don't you are not facing a, a heuristic approach um, to, or you are not using a heuristic approach that doesn't uh, guarantee let's say this this convergence with when using quantum feature selection you know you are you are uh, covering a broader scope of, of subsets you could you could be using and in fact uh, the accuracy gets. Uh, Gets boosted in this in this particular case, so it's something that uh, that could bring really no, interesting no. results in the short term. Yeah, I don't know if somebody has no. questions because I I can hear a mic open. So, uh, but if you have questions, yes, you can ask me, or we can have them at at the end. We um, just, we just muted the person. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> uh, so we we actually boosted also this uh, this uh, exercise with counter protocols, which we will be presenting in in. QTML next next week, and it's it's really interesting how you can basically by a simple evolution by a simple run of, of a circuit uh, produce the subset of, of of features that are really close to the maximum information or, or minimum energy in this case uh, of your of your problem. So it's a it's a really interesting feature that you can basically directly implement uh, and or sorry it's a really interesting algorithm that you can directly implement in it that. Basically, will be applicable to to many of the industries you 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 will be you will be working with. Um, when we take a step further and we try to convert this classical data into quantum data, as as it was explained before, uh, you need to find efficient ways to to do this. And and it, this has been already discussed for a while. But quantum kernels and quantum support vector machines have have been there. Let's say trying to compete with the with the state of the art when it comes to to classical to, to classical um, uh, processes or classical kernels and and it's really interesting to see how these results came out. Uh, I, I'm leaving you the reference there if you if you want to test because there are there are not many qubits required for this okay. exercise and this is a realistic uh, data set that you can access the breast cancer data set and you can already see that 
just by including this quantum uh, translation between the classical uh, data space and the quantum data space, there is some uh, improvement on the separability of the samples, which is also, which is a, a really a good, uh, a really good aspect of, of this uh, full methodology that you can actually separate better your, your individuals within, within your data set, which is, which is really good. But if you combine it with a, with a, an answer that benefits from this uh, from this quantum trans, uh, translation, you can actually bring these models, these quantum models that that could compete with classical with classical counterparts. And one interesting thing about this uh, article in particular that I leave you the reference there is that they they use for they they used it against the fashion MNIST uh, data set. But the, the the key aspect that I wanted to highlight is that. If you look at the combination between kernel and ANSATS, which in this case is angle uh, encoding and amplitude encoding for the translation from classical to quantum, and QAOA and hardware-specific ANSATS for, for the part that is trainable, if you look, uh, there is a, a, a pairing done that basically renders the same results. If you look at the amplitude encoding and hardware-efficient ANSATS against um, angle encoding and, and QAOA, which is a problem specific answer. So you can see that you can actually perform in an equal manner. And that means that you can select the kernel and you can select the answers that will be easily encoded into your hardware so that it performs uh, the best it can do in this in this type of setup. So it's, it's a matter of selecting and setting up this architecture so that it benefits the use case and actually the usage of the hardware you're 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 going to implement this this solution in. So it's it's really interesting that you had these 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 talks before about the architectures of the of the quantum neural networks or the quantum models because it's really really relevant how we select these kernel uh, quantum kernel and quantum ansatz or or ansatz blocks so that it they they benefit from from each other and they they do a good a good pairing between them. Um, lastly, from 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 the QML or pure, pure industry related QML side. Uh, we have been working a lot with quantum convolution and neural networks. And it's really interesting. This is one of the first uh, examples I can I can I can remember having an application, in particular health-related application, that basically they took uh, one of these convolutions and replaced them with, with, a, with a quantum version of that convolution. And, and it's interesting that they could get good results with it. But it's more interesting when you expand this exercise and you you see that by including this quantum convolution and hardware could be hardware specific quantum convolutions that you decrease a lot um, the 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 number of parameters that are needed without uh, decreasing uh, the accuracy of the model. So it's a way in which you can compress the the huge uh, parameters that are needed by the by the, the huge number of parameters that are needed by the resonance, which is in the range of millions to uh, the range of thousands that you need just doing some quantum convolutions in a final, let's say, classical uh, layer that does the, the, the final classification. So it's it's really interesting the level of compaction you can get uh, uh, with these quantum neural networks and, and quantum convolutions. So uh, it's I, I wanted to, to, to highlight also that uh, it's not um, it's not only uh, using quantum that that will make it to, to the industry most of the times they the industry players will get asked why why quantum and why it was added and this is this is fair and um, we need to really provide them with good answers to why this quantum layer is adding something uh, at the metric we are measuring so why the entanglement um uh, creates a better separability in your data set in your particular data set and it's I'm I'm letting there also some uh, a reference on some people that is already exploring this why different answers and different um, answers that, that that reflect the entanglement in a different way how they can pair with or how they can pair with different types of data this one is using the MNIST data but we can do the same exercise with different data sets and it's not that evident how the data complexity and the entanglement capacity of a given answer are paired in order to provide this advantage. So this is a, a, a path that actually would be needed to, to study in order to argue when, when an industry is asked why you included quantum in your models, and 
you have the answer. This is given to the data complexity and how the entanglement uh, affects this data complexity when representing it into the quantum uh, uh, domain. So it's it's really a, a question that we will be getting asked more and more, I would say, and it's fair. And we need to come up with answers that that actually bring the 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 benefit of adding entanglement and adding this quantum formalism to, to our classical models. Lastly, uh, also to, to, to recover this, this initial uh, conversation about what is quantum machine learning, uh, it's really interesting that we found some, um, some use cases that go in the other side. Like we, we could use machine learning to, to actually boost the way in which we produce quantum algorithms. So in this particular case, physics in formula networks were used to improve the way in which we're including counter uh, protocols and, and the scheduling function. So the network is, is basically suggesting what are the, the scheduling functions and, and terms we should use in order to, to boost, enhance further and compress the, 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 the algorithm we will be using in a realistic hardware. So it's, it's, it's really interesting how these, um, how you can look at from the other side. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't restrict myself to those that are those, those, um, cases where the industry puts us into a given direction using the data in one way and, and, and the quantum devices in a different way. But uh, it's it's important that we are always aware of how this uh, can be implemented in the industry, which in this case probably is more related to the academia. And we are aware of what are the, the other things, the other pieces of the of the puzzle that we could use for industry related use cases. But I wanted to, to highlight also this work because I think it's really interesting from the quantum machine learning, uh, with the broader perspective of quantum machine learning. And as final remarks uh, on, on this, so it looks like quantum machine learning could be that, that thing that brings uh, uh, early stage quantum usefulness right, to, to the industry. But one of them, um, I would say that in order to do that, we need to, to select real, select the use cases that we are posed with, with actually the devices that they will run into. Uh, devices and services that, that we will be using, in particular, so that they benefit from the local topology and the, the service specification, let's say the, the type of device we will be using, and also understand how this specific hardware and this specific setup contributes would be an entanglement or contributes to the overall uh, scope of the of the, the use case. More importantly, I would say that we need to look beyond, and this has been discussed many times before, we need to look beyond um, the accuracy, the pure accuracy. So we need to look into network compaction. If we get shallower models and we get models that are more efficient, if we get balanced metrics, if we get models that are less biased or process efficiency, or even some of the targets that, that many industries have, like energy being energy efficient, if these inclusion of quantum formalism and quantum hardware actually brings us any closer to this to this goal of uh, on energy efficiency. So uh, last remark, remember that AI has suffered a lot on answering questions and uh, if the impact it has uh, on users and being able to, uh, as an industry, let's say you need to be able to respond on why these decisions or this inference were done in a, in, in a given way. So it's important that we are well aware of what are, what would be the demands from, even from a regulatory perspective of what our models would be able to, to do and how we need to extract, ex kind of do some explainability on these models so that we can um, respond to those questions that our customers are our industry players will be will be posed with. And with that, I, I want to finish and thank you all for for, for staying that long. <laughs> great, fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Iris, for the great talk. Uh, so it's time for questions. If there are some questions to our speaker, let's see. I don't see questions on the chat, but maybe someone would like to unmute and ask. Yeah, there's just an appreciation comment yeah. uh, to acknowledge that it was very good talk. So very good. Thanks, Sebastian. All right. I don't see questions uh, on the chat. So uh, before I stop recording, uh, maybe just two more announcements. Um, so after the conference, uh, we'll send uh, an email to all the registered participants and there will be a feedback form. So uh, uh, we'll be keen to, to read your opinions on the conference and how we can improve in the future. 
uh, we also ask the part and we'll also uh, ask the participants to uh, or uh, the speakers to to upload their slides to the Google Drive folder to which we've already shared the link. So we'll also share the link once again. Uh, and hopefully, if there are no technical issues, uh, the video recording will be later available uh, on our YouTube channel. So we'll um, share the link to, to the channel once again. All right, I don't see more questions on the chat. So uh, you're right. Thank you once again for the great presentation. Thank you. We'd also me. like to thank all the participants. Uh, so I can tell that there were almost 500 uh, registered participants. Uh, so we are really impressed. And uh, at the peak point, there were more than 70 people here. So I hope that everyone enjoyed and uh, we look forward to uh, to meet you on our next uh, events. Thank you very much. Thank you.